The meeting is now reconvened to open session. The board would like to remind the public that this meeting is being audio and video recorded. It is also available via live stream for the public through links found on the front page of the RUSD website. We would also remind everyone to please enter and exit through the lobby. Tonight we have my Nayeli Glode from Whitney High as our student board rep. Nayeli, will you please introduce the color guard and lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Ladies and gentlemen, please stand for the presentation of the colors by the Rockland Unified School District's Junior ROTC Color Guard and the Pledge of Allegiance. The commander and U.S. flag bearer for this evening's Color Guard is Cadet Captain Caitlin Burns. The state flag is carried by Cadet First Lieutenant Ryan Manning. The right guard is Cadet Technical Sergeant Sophia Burkhalter. The left guard is Cadet Airman Basic Christopher Renner. The alternate tonight is Cadet Lieutenant Colonel Liam Turley. Thank you very much for that. And we will now move to our special recognition and presentations portion of the meeting. Um, Bill McDonald, will you introduce our family partners in education recognition tonight? Yes, good evening, Board of Trustees, Superintendent Stock. Uh, you know in our USD we highly value our families and everything they provide for our schools. This evening I have the honor of introducing Principal Goddard from Cobblestone Elementary and the Wright family. Greetings and good evening to the board and superintendent stock. I have been looking forward to this all day. Um, and I'm going to try not to get real emotional because um, the family that we're honoring tonight has had a presence on our campus, I think, for the last nine years and has done incredible work for our students, our staff, our school, our community, and me personally. So I'm going to try not, try, I'm going to try and stick to what I've written here. <laughs> And it's difficult to capture the feeling and uh, the contributions. But first, let me do some introductions. We have Becky Wright here, who has um, been on our campus for nine years in leading all kinds of amazing um, activities related to music and the arts. And we have Lindsay, her daughter, who just left Cobblestone and is now in seventh grade. We have Justin, which is dad in the family. Um, we've been working just while we were waiting on some financial things for the district, so I'll keep you posted on that. And then we have Krissa, who is a ninth grader at Whitney. And um, so, and Krissa and Lindsay both went to Cobblestone, as well as their older sister. So, they're all here tonight. So, we are thrilled, I am thrilled to extend our heartfelt appreciation to Becky Wright for her exceptional dedication and invaluable contributions to our elementary school music program. Becky, with the support from her two daughters and her husband, have demonstrated an unwavering commitment to fostering a vibrant musical environment and enriching the lives of our young students through her enthusiastic volunteer work. From leading classroom music and after-school choir to supporting our first grade gingerbread man play I'm not going to break out into run, run as fast as you can. You can't catch me on the gingerbread man. But the whole school does when they do the play. And the Three Piggy Opera. These are important musical rites of passage 
that are something the whole school looks forward to every year, and they're because of Becky. From the moment Becky began our choir program as a volunteer, her passion for music and genuine interest in nurturing the talents of our students became abundantly clear. We wrote grants together. We tried to get extra funding. We tried to do all kinds of things. It's not surprising that she has had over 50 children each session participate in choir. And that's in a school of 400. And that's offering it just to fourth through sixth graders. For over nine years, Becky has seamlessly integrated herself in our school community, devoting countless hours to rehearsals, performances, and administrative tasks that kept our after-school choir program running smoothly. Her organizational skills, creative ideas, and willingness to go above and beyond have been instrumental in planning successful school assemblies and events in our community, including at the Fountains, Starbucks, Borders, and Quarry Park Adventures. By volunteering her time and expertise, Becky has also demonstrated the profound impact that parents can have on enriching the educational experience of our students. In recognition of her outstanding dedication and remarkable contributions, I am so proud to honor Becky tonight. Her selflessness, creativity, and dedication to the arts have truly made a lasting impression on our school community and helped hundreds of students enjoy the experience or experience the joy of music. Thank you, Becky, for your extraordinary efforts in nurturing the musical talents of our students and for being an exemplary model of community involvement. You are just amazing, and so is your family. So, Becky Wright. Yeah. Becky. <laughs> you can face me for now. Um, <laughs> so, I wish we could clone this family. They are a model family in our community that have been there for our kids and have been there for our schools. And this is exactly what we need. These are the exact type families that we love to see on our campuses who are working hard for the students and working with the staff and doing so much for our kids. And we're so very grateful for the right family and for Becky and all that she does for our kids. Treat for our new bagel shop family. <laughs> and then will you all step over to the wall and take a Right, and now, Marty Flowers, will you introduce our employee recognition tonight? President Hub, Trustee, Superintendent Stock, it's my honor to uh, introduce this employee from Whitney High School, but I don't get to do the introductions, but I will say that this person, just like our families that go above and beyond, we have many employees that go ab above and beyond, and this one certainly uh, goes above and beyond. So with that, uh, I get to introduce Principal Scott Collins. Yeah, a lot, of, a lot of Whitney for a second. Nayeli, there she is. Pause up. Yeah. Uh, Board of Trustees, Superintendent Stock, uh, it is with uh, absolute pleasure um, that we are celebrating tonight Miss Carrie Schlenz. She has been a, an, a just an exemplary, phenomenal employee, um, the backbone of the athletic department for, for many, many years um, at, at Whitney High School. Um, she was, she was an employee at Whitney High School before I was a teacher there, uh, coming up on 10 years ago. Um, just 
work so hard for our kids, work so hard for our staff. We have, uh, how many coaches do we have? We have 7,000 coaches <laughs> at Whitney. <laughs> Plus or minus, Barbara. Um, but that, that, that she's always juggling and, and making sure they have the paperwork and, and uh, all the fields and um, just does an amazing job of looking after Coach French, which that's a full-time job unto itself. Um, but more than that, she's just a great person. Um, and, and we love coming to work and working with her every single day. Um, she's our friend. She's a, a, a phenomenal mom. Her, her daughter's here uh, celebrating her today, and her daughter is a teacher at Whitney High School after graduating from Whitney High School. Um, so we are, we are rolling deep with the Schlenz family um, and, and its matriarch who we're celebrating today, uh, Miss Carrie Schlenz. So again, Mr. Collins, Harry, um, what he didn't say, and this is all the parts that most of the, and I can, I can take it from every kid that's ever been an athlete, been around Whitney, from a freshman to a senior and all the way through. This is the one that makes sure that that one random form that you need to get filled out, this one medical exemption piece, this, this uniform code, um, all the different your, your mom still needs to sign this. This needs to be autographed in triplicate, et cetera, et cetera. All those things have to happen, and they all come through Carrie. And Carrie juggles them for three seasons, all the sports, freshman, freshman JV, varsity, all the kids, boys, girls, everything. And she does it with a smile on her face, and every kid walks in that, that room and, and with the sad of, what did I do wrong? And she walks them through. Here's what you got to do. Here's what you got to take care of. And she does an amazing job at it and keeps all the names, all the events, all the things going on on the side. So all those fields, all the different CIF requirements that have to happen, all the different state or local areas or the, SAC or the SFL stuff, she balances all that. And again, like he said, not only Coach French and, and the athletic department, but every coach at that high school comes and goes, hey, Carrie, I need this now. Or hey, can you pull this data for me? Or this kid that graduated through two years ago, they need a letter of recommendation, they were talking about this, Do you know, can you get me information? And she balances all this and all this every time, every day. So thank you, thank you, thank you. You do so much for us, thank you. That, you have a certificate? Yeah. We have a gift bag, I can't tell you all the cool stuff that's in it. And so it was sponsored by some other people, but we'll make sure it's all good, good. Thank so you. thank you, thank, thank you, you, thank, you. thank you. Frank, let's go, we need yeah. Yeah. a family shot. All right, awesome, thank you so much. We now have item 5.3, Matt Murphy, Director of Personnel Services. Will you please join us to present the two new Whitney High School assistant principals. So Board of Trustees, Superintendent Stock, thank you for allowing me to come in front of you tonight to do some more celebrations. I was gonna say, Mr. Counter, uh, you handed the mic to you know who got back here. We were a little worried when that happened. Yeah, a little worried. No, um, it is a pleasure to be in front of you tonight. Uh, we have actually for the next two items, three individuals uh, that just excited to bring into our team of administrators. Um, I was thinking about it. I, I actually mentor beginning administrators. In just like every facet of the school district, um, they're all important, but walking into an admin, administrative role, especially assistant principal at high school, uh, is probably one of the more challenging ones. And both of the individuals I'm about to introduce um, are already doing an outstanding job. 
Um, I'm going to share some information about each of them uh, related to how they ended up here and all the wonderful things that they bring with them. And then um, once they're done, I'll give them a chance to give a little conversation with you, and then we'll do a picture over here. So first up, I'd like to invite up Kelly Krasner. Kelly. So Kelly was hired in 2001 as a resource teacher at Rockland High School. In 2005, she moved into a special day class at Whitney High School and has been there ever since. Kelly's leadership experience is vast, as evidenced by the following examples. She was a member of the Strategic Priority Action Planning Team. She's been a BITS of support provider. She uh, has been a PLC coordinator. She's been a secondary summer school assistant principal. She has served on the Behavior Task Force. She has been a teacher in charge for Whitney High School, and she's been an MTSS coordinator. That's just to name a few. Additionally, Kelly is one of the select group of teachers who have been recognized as Placer County's teacher who makes a difference, not once, but twice in 2003 and 2012. And with that said, Human Resources is proud to present Kelly Krasner to the superintendent and board of trustees as the new assistant principal at Whitney High School. Kelly. Thank you so very much for this opportunity. I've had a full circle moment sitting, in, sitting next to a um, student teacher, sitting next to a, a, a teacher who's had a, a year or two under her belt and just remembered that moment when I came to Rockland Unified as that brand new teacher walking onto the Rockland High School campus, scared to death, and then embracing all the opportunities that Rockland Unified School District has provided to me and going through all of my opportunities to try different facets of education. And sitting next to the teachers just now just allows me and reminds me of the opportunity that I now have to be able to bring teachers to Whitney High School, to support the teachers, to support the students. And so I just wanted to thank you so, so very much for this opportunity. I'm just kind of like goose bumpy excited. Um, it, is a, it is a job that I take very, very seriously, and um, I'm just honored for the opportunity. Thank you. Welcome, Kelly. Welcome. Thank you. Take your picture. Yep. <laughs> Best part. All right. Thanks, Kelly. All right. To keep the Whitney theme going, let's invite up Lisa Gack. Lisa began her teaching career at Backrot Elementary School in San Jose as a second grade bilingual teacher in 1995. <laughs> we went back. No. Um, she moved to Rockland Unified in 1997, and in her 26 years in Rockland Unified, Lisa has taught kinder and first grade at Breen, kinder and first grade at Twin Oaks, kinder at Valley View, kinder K-1, third and fourth at Rucola, then she transitioned, transitioned to Whitney High School. In 2015, she served as a Spanish teacher with Spanish 1, 2, and 3 honors classes while also serving as the World Language Department Chair. In addition to her teaching, Lisa has acted as a parent-teacher representative, was the World Language Pilot Teacher, served as on the WASC Accreditation Committee, and has served as teacher in charge. And without reservation, Human Resources is proud to present Lisa Gack to the superintendent and board of trustees as the new assistant principal at Whitney High School. I just want to say thank you so much for letting me be here. And as you can tell, um, the only thing I haven't taught is middle school. But yes, I've taught everything except seventh and eighth grade. Um, it's been a great, great career. Um, I'm just kind of going where I think, feel like I'm needed. I just want to help the students. I want to help them find themselves, help them grow, help them find their passion, their purpose, and themselves. All right, thank you so much. Thank you, Lisa, welcome. While well, you guys 
guys are lining up. Sorry, can I just add one thing? Lisa and Kelly, it's amazing to hear the vast experience that you had, and we are so um, happy to hear that and welcome you. You guys have a big job, and we just want you to know we're here to support you. All right, Mr. Murphy, if you could please continue with item 5.4, presentation of the Director of Transportation. All right, thank you. So earlier I said, you know, in, in the ranks of administration, being a high school assistant principal is a challenging job. However, we might have a topper here. Director of Transportation for a school district is no easy task. I'd like to welcome up Matt Hebb. Matt's previous experience outside the district and within Rockland Unified make him uniquely qualified for his new position. He has worked in the research and development industry. He's owned his own market research company. He was the general manager and owner of a pet mobile business. He was a project manager for a vertical conveyor company. And he has also been a school bus driver, a dispatcher, and a driver for the Nevada County Transit System. Since Matt started his career in uh, Rockland Unified in 2021 as the routing technician in, in the transportation department, he then served as the transportation supervisor for the last two years. Human Resources uh, is presenting and proud to bring Matt Ford to the Superintendent and Board of Trustees as the new Director of Transportation for Rockland Unified. One other piece, we want to make sure we re recognize Jill Gialdo. Uh, Jill was nice enough to, she was once the, our transportation director many years ago and stepped in as an interim as we made this transition. So we thank her for that too. So here's Matt. Thank you, President Huff, trustees, Superintendent Stock. I'm really excited about the opportunity that uh, I have gotten here with uh, Rockland. Only been here two and a half years, and um, I've received many blessings from the school district. First, to be uh, chosen to be a router, and then also to uh, supervisor, and she supported me through my training to become a state certified instructor, and now as a director. Um, we have a great team. We're fully staffed, and uh, we're looking forward to the year and bringing on the new electric buses. So, thank you very much. Thank you, Matt. We're excited to have you. Is Matt's over there? He. <laughs> It, it, we are a rare transportation department in the nation that has, as people are electrifying their fleet, Matt has a degree in electrical engineering from UC Berkeley. So we are ahead of the curve um, in electrification. <laughs> We're very thankful to have you, Matt. Uh, and now we want to thank you and our families for joining us. And while you are more than welcome to stay for the rest of the meeting, now is an excellent time to make your exit. <laughs> <laughs> All right, for item 5.5, I'd like to introduce Rockland Police Chief Rustin Banks to present the Rockland Police Department's annual report. Thumbs up. <laughs> uh, good evening, President Hupp, trustees, Superintendent Stock. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you tonight. I'm Rustin Banks, Police Chief for the City of Rockland, and it's an honor to present you with our 2022 annual report. I'm going to turn it over to our crime analyst, Sean Barrett, here in a second. But before I do that, I wanted to also point out that it's actually 
National Crime Analyst Day today. So you're going to receive a presentation on National Crime Analyst Day. So I want to thank you um, publicly just for the work that she does every day in addition to coming to uh, presentations uh, at night like this with me. So she's going to go through the report. I'll come back. I'm going to give a few highlights from 2023, and then we can answer any questions that you guys might have. Thanks. All right. Um, so this presentation is a brief overview of our department's annual report, and it has been posted to our website for viewing in its entirety. Since 2005, Rockland's population has increased 45%, with an average growth of 2.2% per year and an average crime rate of 18.2. Total crime during this period averaged 1,083 crimes per year, with 2022 within the range of average. The previous year's annual report reported a lower crime rate than what was published in this year's report. This discrepancy is due to a change in reporting of NIBRS versus UCR crime stats. NIBRS stands for National Incident Crime-Based Reporting System and gives a more accurate picture of crime occurring in the city. By capturing data and details of each single crime incident as well as separate offenses within the same incident, the previous reporting system, UCR, or Uniform Crime Reporting, only captured a portion of the incident and its total offenses by using a hierarchy method. Rockland ended 2022 with a total of 1,080 reported crimes and a crime rate of 15.1, which is a decrease from 2021's total 1,146 reported crimes and a crime rate of 16.3 crimes per 1,000 residents. Violent crime decreased 17% from the previous year, which includes the categories of homicide, rape, robbery, and aggravated assault. Rape decreased 43%, robbery increased 12% or two crimes, an aggravated assault decreased 6% with a total of 48, down from 51 reported crimes in 2021. Property crime decreased 5% for the year, which includes the categories of burglary, larceny, vehicle theft, and arson. Burglary includes residential and commercial, decreased 19%. Larceny, 773 reported crimes, an increase of one crime from last year, which was neither an increase nor decrease. Of those 773 crimes, 381 reported theft from vehicles accounted for 49% of all larceny for the year. Shoplifting increased for the year with 139 reported crimes, an increase of 53% from 2021. Vehicle theft decreased 16% and arson decreased 29%. Larceny theft continues to be the city's main source of crime, contributing approximately 71% of the year's total crime, with the majority of larceny categorized as theft from vehicles, which decreased 17% for the year. The city averaged 31 reported burglar vehicle burglaries per month, down from the previous year's 38 reported thefts a month, th thefts a month which includes the theft of catalytic converters. The police department took a total of 89 reports for the theft of catalytic converters for the year, compared to 149 the previous year, a decrease of 40%. National trends suggest catalytic converter thefts are still on the rise and have increased 540% in 2022. California accounts for more than 30% of the nation's total catalytic converter theft. Although Rockland still continues to have thefts, the city is currently experiencing a decrease. I'm going to knock on wood here. The communication center answered more than 81,700 calls, 63,263 were business line calls, and dispatchers fielded more than 18,437 911 calls. Overall police incidents decreased 5% to 50,834. 39% of police incidents were officer-initiated activity, and 61% were citizens-generated calls for service. Law enforcement calls for service decreased 5% to 31,120, and officer-initiated activity decreased 4% to 19,714. Patrol response times for all three call priorities increased compared to previous years. Control completed 373 felony arrests and 842 misdemeanor. 
increases of 12, 24% and 11% respectively. Overall, total arrests increased from 1,061 to 1,215, or a 15% increase. Total on-campus activity for Rockland Unified School Resource Officers increased 8% compared to the previous year. There were 2,237 call, total calls on campus, 600 calls for service, and 1,637 officer initiated. Top citizen calls for service, uh, oh, what, citizen calls for service decreased 25%. The top calls for service include alarm calls, juvenile problem calls, citizen assist, suspicious vehicles or persons, and traffic complaints. Officer initiated activity increased 29%. 67% of all on-campus officer initiate activity was for school checks. Top activities were school checks, juvenile problem calls, security checks, traffic stops, and traffic complaints. 62 cases were taken by school resource officers on various campuses. The majority were non-criminal information only type reports for documentation, lost found property, mental health related collisions, etc., with a minimal amount of reports taken for criminal offenses. And that includes our, concludes our presentation. All right, I'll jump back in, um, give a couple more updates, and then answer any questions you might have. As a de for the department as a whole, really our priority in 2023, um, you'll see has, has been technology. We continue to try and seek out and find um, a more effective, more efficient way of doing business. Earlier this year, we installed 32 uh, automatic license plate reader cameras throughout the city. Um, they notify us when a stolen vehicle comes in. It also helps us quite a bit with um, our property crime, organized retail crime, and, and really all the different um, categories. Uh, we'll continue to go down that path. We think that that's the way that we can pr provide the highest level of service to this community. We're looking into a, like a real-time crime center type approach where we'll be able to use the cameras and some infrastructure that we have in the city to um, be able to monitor. So as a call comes in, we'll have an officer responding out. We'll also have somebody back at the station pulling up the cameras that we have in the, in the area, providing those updates so that we're doing it in the safest way possible. We're being effective and efficient and being able to call out vehicles and directions of travel and all those types of things. It's the way of the future for our industry, and so we're, we're trying to kind of be at the, at the forefront. Um, update specific to our, our partnership with Rockland Unified. Um, we've been, I don't know if you guys have heard this story, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna get to break the news. We actually, towards the end of last year, um, we worked with some of our retail business owners in the retail centers around Rockland High and, uh, and Granite Oaks. And what we were hearing is some of our students, either on the way to school or on the way home, I'm sure you guys have heard it as well, um, with some mischievous activity. Sometimes nothing that might not reach a criminal level, but something you know, blocking traffic or, or um, causing a ruckus of sorts. And so uh, I want to thank uh, Superintendent Sock and, and Marty Flowers. We actually brought the business owners together and we had a town hall and we heard from them um, and we came up with a plan and, and being able to um, look at the behavior uh, and have it covered under the Ed Code on their, their way to school and on their way home, the partnership that we've been able to develop over this past summer uh, has been really great and we were prepared for the first day of school when sure enough uh, one of our Starbucks <laughs> down there um, uh, shot us a call and said hey we had some students come in and acting in a way that probably doesn't meet the standards of Rockland Unified or or of the community and immediately uh, Principal Stewart and, and Marty everyone really stepped up and next thing I know we have a fairly large group of students uh, headed down to Starbucks putting handshakes on the store manager and apologizing. And um, it was something that I immediately, uh, I got a letter from corporate thanking, saying, hey, we're, we're experiencing this everywhere. We're not experiencing that type of response. And so um, I it was just a, a really great story and, and kind of highlights the importance of the partnership and the collaboration. So I want to thank everyone that played a role in that. Um, Rockland Police Activity League, we've been putting a lot of effort into this past year. Exciting stuff, actually. Uh, Mr. Flowers uh, came onto the board and has been a great asset there, uh, along with Councilmember Gallo, who I think is in the back. Um, but just bringing in that that insight into the students, and we've 
now have a year of our CrossFit program. Um, it's been awesome. Any, any given Tuesday and Thursday, we're over here at Anywhere Fit on Granite Drive, 25 to 30, probably um, 7th to 12th graders in there doing CrossFit, learning how to lift um, with good technique and um, building those relationships with our officers. So we're really excited about where that program uh, will continue to go. Our Junior Police Academy was uh, another hit full, uh, completely full this summer. Um, those are for 7th, 8th, and 9th graders. Had a great time bringing them into our walls, teaching them about the police department, and even got to spend some time over at the, the quarry on the ropes course. Um, one program we're looking to develop this year is our late night basketball. I'm hopeful that on one of the breaks, maybe spring break, maybe during the summer, we're hopeful that we can uh, come together maybe on a Friday night, bring our officers out, use Rock Pal, maybe a three-on-three -three tournament. We're kind of kicking around some different ideas, but as we continue to expand Rock Pal, um, we're, uh, that's one of the directions we're wanting to go, and I would be remiss if I didn't also say that this Saturday happens to be the first annual cornhole tournament for Rock Pal, so I would expect that uh, um, we'll be out there having a good time, and we'd love to see anyone if, uh, if you have time. I think it starts at 11. Uh, one other thing, actually I have two more. Expansion of the Youth Services Unit. We had uh, SROs at each high school. We've also had an SRO at the middle schools. That was funded through a tobacco grant. That grant expired um, in June, and you guys decided to come and, and, and continue that partnership. You decided that that was a, a worthy um, uh, you know, program, and so we, want, we just want to say thank you for, for funding that third school resource officer. Um, Jay Newton's in the middle schools doing what he does, and it, I think it's, a, it, it's good for, for everyone involved. Um, and then lastly, we just continue to appreciate the seat at the, the safety committee meetings. It's a good opportunity to uh, speak with staff, speak with teachers, speak with parents, and, and make sure that we're doing everything we can to keep those lines of communication open. So that's all I have, and if there's any questions, I'll probably let Sean answer them. I just wanted to say thank you so much for the partnership. We are incredibly fortunate to have such a interactive partnership with our police force and local law enforcement. We are really, really grateful for all of your hard work. Thank you. Yeah, I, I'm saying the same thing. Um, I know being at different events, seeing the SROs, seeing them on campus, um, amazing. Thank you guys for the meeting support, the SROs, all, all the things you do in our school and with the kids, it's amazing. Um, from a community st standpoint, I will say thank you for your intervention with uh, some retail crime that we've had in the recent past. Um, it, it's amazing that, it, 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 and I laugh, and, and I know we've had this conversation, it can happen anywhere, it just doesn't happen in Rockland. So thank you guys for doing that. Um, you, don't, you didn't get enough credit for this, and I will try to clear this up. Back in mid-July, when we had a, a specific individual that escaped from a hospital, it was your guys that brought him down and brought him into. So you didn't get enough credit on that. They just said overall law enforcement. So thank you, Rockland PD, for stepping up and making that happen and keeping our neighborhood safe. Thank you for everything you guys do. Um, and then I'll ask just in general, how can we help? How can we support? What can we do to help you guys out and, and keep making it successful? No, you're doing it. The, the, I, I, I think we do this really well between our two uh, entities, and I'm, I'm excited to see it continue. So. I just wanted to take a second to echo some thanks, uh, Chief Banks. I, I, I'm pretty sure every community event I'm at, I see your face at as well. And, and I say, um, you know, that is a beautiful thing when we are able to have a relationship that's so positive with our police force. And that's because of your leadership. And so thank you both for the report today. Um, thank you for not only the handout, but the, the good information. There's so many things that I could highlight, but I did want to highlight a couple. And you hit some of them at the end. You stole some of my points. Um, I but I do want to make sure to do a public thank you. Um, uh, for a lot of the collaborative work that we've been able to do as a district with RPD, specifically your youth services. Um, you have a phenomenal team doing your youth services. Uh, there are many times where I know we're able to just call or text or say, hey, 
here's what's going on in the community. How can we help? How can you help? Um, and so I really appreciate specifically the Rockland Police Activities League and the SROs. Um, I, I have spoken with many families that have been benefactors of that. So thank you for the great work there. Uh, also, I'd be remiss if I didn't highlight your fentanyl work. Um, I mean, you guys really are leaders in the state. Uh, and so I, I thank you for that as, as a mom, as a, as a trustee. Uh, thank you for your dedication to keeping our community safe and keeping um, unsafe materials out of our community. So thank you for that. Um, also wanted to highlight the, the safety committee work. Uh, that's no easy task. That's time that you and your staff are dedicating to work directly with our school district to say, hey, the safety of our schools is a priority here in Rockland. It's a priority to us. Um, I know I've had many parents reach out and I've been able to share with them some of the results of that safety committee work. And so I just wanted to do a public thank you to you and your staff that are, have been able to sit on that um, because a lot of the decisions we've made uh, have come by your recommendation um, from our local police force, the professionals. Uh, so I just wanna thank you for the time and dedication uh, that you guys have put on that um, and then I, I also wanted to just in light of the safety committee and, and that work um, would love to open a door for continued assistance uh, with RPD uh, and uh, Superintendent Stock uh, would love to look at uh, something being brought back to the board specifically about a formal assessment for our campuses. I know we've done great work with our safety committee. Uh, I know we have a couple nearby districts that have taken similar action, whether it be a third party, whether it be a joint task force, um, but a formal assessment of our campuses, a walkthrough to really identify each campus, any areas of weakness, um, I'd love to see a bid come back to the board uh, for that uh, with a timeline of some actionable steps that we can take. Uh, yeah, Trustee Setoff will be happy to do that, and we're uh, grateful that the board last year in its uh, three-year spending plan of some one-time funds allocated funds for that, and so we, we appreciate the board putting the resources forth, and we'll be back uh, this year with a full report um, on, on that assessment, and, and we'll be, of course, coordinating and working with our uh, Rockland Police Department uh, to make sure that it's as comprehensive in nature and really gives a, a full view. Thank you, I look forward to seeing that, and thank you again for your incredible work. Thank you. Sean, I'm guessing that you like numbers and data and all of this, which is so <laughs> awesome. I loved all the details, and thank you for the beautiful copy. Can you share with me, I'm just curious, how do we compare to other cities in our state, maybe of similar size, like crime percentage rate? Um, it's hard to compare cities mm -hmm. just because demographics are so different. Mm -hmm. um, Rockland has, a low crime rate compared to a lot of cities. Um, but again, it's just hard to compare just because of- Apples to apples, yeah, right. Yeah, there mm -hmm. really is no comparison because everything is just so different from city to city. Even though populations may be similar, you know, some have more residential, some have different business type structures, you know, hotels right. or things that, um, and then also location, things like that affect crime rates as well. Okay. But Rockland's continuously been pretty low in the crime rate. Thank you. Yeah, it's rare, I think, to see a 15.1 yeah. crime rate. Yeah, I think so, too. And I like what you said, there's no comparison. I, there's a lot of reasons why I live here, but one of which is I close my eyes at night and feel totally safe. So I appreciate that. Out of you know 18,000 calls, we as a school board appreciate 2,000 of those were to our USD. And so thank you for the work that you do to keep our students and our staff safe. I know when we um, did some initial research, maybe it's before the safety committee, Students feel safer seeing those SRO officers on our campus, which is awesome. That's how we want them to feel as well. So thank you for all you do. Thank you. All right, so exciting to hear from our police force uh, next, we will have our uh, RTPA representative, Heather Winter. Thank you for being here, Heather. Oh, also, I don't see Chuck here, so I'm uh, going to skip over the uh, CSEA after. RTPA. 
Good evening, uh, trustees and superintendent stock. Um, today I stand before you to address a pressing concern that affects the heart of our educational system, which is the authority of school boards to unilaterally create new policies. Education is a complex and multifaceted field that involves a myriad of stakeholders, including parents, students, teachers, administrators, and community members. Making unilateral decisions without considering the input of these stakeholders is a disservice to the very people our schools are meant to serve. Many people of this community felt and feel deflated and unsupported after the last board meeting from the haste of your vote, roughly two minutes after hearing the last comment, which really gives the perception that you came to the meeting with your minds already made up and were just going through the motions. Two of you have sat on a district labor management group composed of educators, administrators, and district personnel. You've been a part of a long process of building bridges, becoming more transparent, and solving problems. My big question is why would you not use the same process for the recent policy you voted through? I also ask, why have a labor collaboration leadership committee? Why invest so much money and time into a culture and process when you then pick and choose to use it as it suits your needs and or interests. The RTPA executive board reached out prior to the September 6th board meeting inquiring how we could collaborate and was only provided a standard response. Educational policies have far reaching consequences impacting everything from curriculum to student well-being. A unilateral approach can lead to hasty decisions that do not adequately consider the potential consequences or alternatives. In contrast, a collaborative process allows for a more comprehensive examination of various perspectives and data-driven decision-making. Collaboration also fosters a sense of ownership and buy-in among stakeholders. When individuals are involved in the decision-making process, they are more likely to support and implement policies effectively. This not only leads to greater success in policy implementation, but also enhances the overall functioning of our educational institutions. Additionally, school boards should acknowledge that they do not possess all the expertise required to make informed decisions on complex educational matters. Input from teachers, administrators, and other experts in the fields is valuable. Policy making should be an inclusive endeavor and in drawing upon the collective wisdom and experience of those who work tirelessly to educate our children. Such inclusivity and collaboration would also contribute to a sense of trust and goodwill within the community. When stakeholders feel heard, and respected, it builds confidence in the educational system. This in turn enhances the reputation of our schools and attracts the support and involvement of parents and community members. Our school board needs to refrain from making unilateral decisions to create new policies. Such an approach risks disregarding the voices of those you represent, but also undermines accountability and informed decision making. Instead, the Rockland Board should embrace a more collaborative, inclusive, and transparent process that honors the diverse perspectives and expertise within our ex sorry, educational community. By working together, we can ensure that our policies truly serve the best interests of our students and the broader community, fostering a brighter future for all. So again, here with our TPA tonight is a CTA board member for District D, Mike Patterson, to speak to the bigger picture, the actions of this board um, that has had on Rockland teachers, uh, students, and the community as a whole. So Mike's part of your RTPA report? And Mike is part of the RTPA report. Thank you, Heather. Uh, 
Before you're completely done, Heather, I did want to say thank you very much for your thoughtful comments. Um, I really appreciated how thoughtful they were and um, how respectfully they were delivered. And I think that um, in, in doing so, um, it will uh, spark some thoughtful conversations. But um, it's, it's really is our hope. We've worked really hard, and the district has spent a lot of money on the collaboration process. I mean, thousands of dollars and sub days for teachers and principals and district personnel to meet together and to solve problems in, a, in such a collaborative way. And, and you can feel the change that it has brought um, between everybody and I'm aware that things operate that we don't always see what's happening behind closed doors um, but also just in our minds having two of you serve on that same committee that a lot of us serve on um, there would have to be a way to take such big decisions whether it's the policy that you passed or any curriculum discussions and put stakeholders in the same room. It's very different hearing from somebody one-on-one -on -one and you're only getting that perspective you know, 20 different times versus putting the stakeholders in the same room and allowing them to hear one another's um, perspectives. Of so a you, one of the things you said in your um, very well delivered report was um, that RTPA reached out to the board members before the policy discussion, and you said that the reply was a standard reply. But I do want to point out that in my reply, I said that I am very open to that discussion and moving forward in labor management. I would love to have that discussion and talk about how it would be possible to um, discuss policy because it is, um, with the Brown Act, we can't even discuss it with each other. And that's something that I said in um, my email response. Uh, I, I would like to explore that. I think there is something there that we can investigate and figure out and understand how to move forward with that. I think it would only be beneficial. I think it's really hard when it happens. I mean, obviously, there's no time with people's busy schedules, right? Um, when it's a week before, um, a lot of people hoping that it was more of a, a discussion and you guys maybe listening and going back and deliberating and having a discussion and then making your decision versus I think the perception of how it happened. So in, in talking about that though, you understand there is no deliberate, like we can't, the only deliberation, deliberation we can do is here on this, on this podium. Like we can't go back and deliberate. So it was it was a definitely a long late night and I don't know if you remember but well, remember every time we tried to talk to each other we got shouted down and um, told to shut up by the crowd. So deliberation is difficult, very difficult under those circumstances. I think it would have been nice had we been able to talk more um, and you say it 2 minutes after the last speaker we took a vote but we actually did speak and try to speak with each other and try to understand each other's point of view. But the room was packed with people who were shouting us down. And so any kind of deliberation under those circumstances, it's impossible. Well, I think, and, and that's the reason for wanting the collaboration. So you guys maybe don't feel that you're put in that position just as well as the stakeholders, the teachers, the people who are really affected by it feel like at least they were heard other than waiting six hours in line to come and hope that they were being heard, but probably that a decision was mentally already made before it was 
me. And I, I mean, it would be just the hopes going forward that we've had a couple of these votes and it was a packed room. It, before maybe decisions are made and before we put it on an agenda, ask, hey, I mean, it was, it seemed like you guys were very um, in tuned with uh, the police chief of wanting to collaborate and do all of these things. And I was just sitting there going, oh, I, I can only hope that they feel the same way and really want to sit and solve problems and, and come together to make it better versus it's really hard when it's um, a board, it feels as if it's a board against other people. We're, we're the people that have to implement what you guys Better decide. Speak. So it, it would just be wonderful for collaboration. It really would. Thank you. Very Thank much. Thank you for the president's report. Hello again. Uh, I'm Mike Patterson. I serve on the CTA Board of Directors. In my 36th year as the auto shop teacher at South Tile High School, and in my eighth year on the CTA Board of Directors. So I spoke here two weeks ago. The most prudent way for the school board to have handled this would have been a non-action item on your agenda and actually listen to people who showed up to speak at the meeting who had very strong feelings. I don't know why the board chose to go in the direction the board went in. So a couple of things. Uh, the California Teachers Association is not going anywhere, which is part of the reason I'm back tonight. I didn't want the board members or the community of Rockland to think that I show up as a board member when I'm asked to by a chapter, make comments and I leave, and you'll never hear from me again. That's not how we operate. I wanna make it really clear. The California Teachers Association is not an outside entity. We are the exclusive bargaining representatives I believe for all of the chapters in Placer County. And so we're not going anywhere. We're a part of the contract. We're gonna support our members and our union leaders, which is why I'm back. I do want to address a couple things that were said in public comment after our comments. There was extremely rude behavior taking place outside in the line. Speakers accused the teachers and our supporters of that rude behavior. That is simply not true. Our members, our supporters were harassed outside and then when those people came in the meeting that were doing the harassing, accused us of doing the harassing. That is Unbelievable, lying is still wrong. And you know, I know the board members weren't outside, but I just need to clear that up. The other thing is, there were no buses. I don't know where some of the speakers at the board meeting saw buses. Nobody was bused in. We did have teachers here from other local associations to support our brothers and sisters in Rockland. There were community members here, but there was no buses. Many people didn't follow the rules. A lot of us were lined up at 4 or 4.30, and then groups came and pushed their way into line to get in the, rule, to get in the room and the board apparently has one set of rules for one group and another set of rules for another group, and that is not acceptable. Mike, this when Travis was up there and he said, read the room, the room was filled with 
rainbow flags. It wasn't filled with people that the board brought. So if you're saying- Ladies and gentlemen, please let her speak. If, Listen. If you're saying we had different rules for different groups, that was not what I was reading in the room. So I was outside. You all were either inside or somewhere else. Groups who were in the room at the start of the meeting squeezed in in front of your students from Rockland? And one, one of them was your husband, Julie. One of them was your husband. Mr. Patterson, this is a president's report, so we're offering you the ability to speak to us. If there's anything conducive to the environment of our jurisdiction, we're happy to talk about it. I understand you were frustrated about the last meeting. Thank you for sharing that. Our president has let you know that that was not an intent of the board. Can you continue on with the president's report, please? So the president of the board asked me a question. I was answering it. She was denying what I was saying was true, and I witnessed it. So I'm just trying to clarify that. So it still blows my mind that this board is willing to waste taxpayers' dollars on defending your illegal actions. You know, I do want to thank Michelle for having the courage to stand up for what is right. You know, I give you big credit. So, Finally, today, September 30th, you all received a letter uh, from CTA staff attorney Brian Smith entitled Rockland USD. I am old. Rockland USD, after the fact, offered to bargain the effects of his new forced outing policy. In order for Rockland to come to the table, which of course we're willing to do, you need to rescind the policy so we can have a level playing field for negotiations. So I know it's not on the agenda tonight, so I know that is not possible, but if this board wants to restore any faith from your employees and this, this community, at the first opportunity, you need to rescind this illegal board policy on forced outing, and then the teachers will come to the table with you and bargain the impacts. Thank you, and if the Rockland Professional Teachers Association asks me to be back, I will be back. Mike, Mr. Patterson. there's some questions. Mr. Patterson, I have a couple questions for you, please. Um, it was stated that a letter was submitted to the board. Uh, could you please let me know who submitted that and at what time? I don't have record of it. So the, the date is today, September 20th. It's addressed to Robert Stock, Superintendent, Rockland Unified School District uh, by Brian Smith, CTA Council. Mm. Do you have uh, a timestamp on that? Did you, did, you did you receive that letter? Um, I believe I did receive a letter and I still frankly, working through all the mail that's come in today, but I did see a letter from CTA, don't have the contents. Of was that. it addressed to the board or just Superintendent Stock? It was addressed to Superintendent Stock, but mm -hmm. all the board members, I under, my understanding, uh, will be receiving the letter as well. I'd be happy to share my email with you, so in the future, if you'd like a letter to come to me, I would be happy to receive that. Uh, you also stated that there were illegal actions taken. Can you please reference what laws were broken? So. The illegal action was the new board policy on force outing, which is against the California law. Which law is that? I am not an attorney. We have great attorneys that work for the California Teachers Association. They brief the board members, and we were briefed that the Chino Hill, excuse me, the Chino Valley and similar board policies are against the law. That's why the letter was sent and the unfair labor practice charge has been filed. I'm not going to Thank you, Mr. Patterson. I just laws. wanted to know what law you were referencing. Uh, we, as I stated at the last meeting, we met with our legal counsel. I would be happy to hear from CTA if there's a specific California law you're citing. Thank you very much. Can I ask a question? Your legal counsel wasn't here during open session at the last board meeting, but I'm understanding she was here during closed session. 
why did you not have counsel during open session when you're dealing with an item that many, including the California Teachers Association feels illegal. Mm -hmm. Why wasn't counsel in the room? I hear you. Um, so it's been the practice of this board that it would actually be very inappropriate. We actually went through some of the similar dialogue back at COVID response uh, that the legal counsel is there to advise the board uh, of the strengths, weaknesses, what is legal, what is not legal. Um, and so uh, it was not actually a closed session that evening. Uh, we received our legal written memo, which is attorney client privilege. Um, so I appreciate you coming tonight I want to keep my comments respectful I simply just want a clarification if there's a specific law that CTA feels we have broken because I have seen this now written and mentioned multiple times I'd be happy to receive it via my email thank you thank you anything else for me all right thank you Now on to item 7.1, comments and report from student board representative, Nayeli Glode, who will please share your report. Good evening, trustees and superintendent stock. Parker Whitney just completed their annual fun run, booster thon fundraiser, and raised a lot of money to go to tech, sports, equipment, software, and so much more. Kids were so excited to duct tape their principal to a pole and slime her at the end of the fun run. They're looking forward to their upcoming book fair and harvest festival. At Cory Trail, students in are celebrating Latin American Independence Days with activities, music, and history. Our dual language, their dual language, TK, kindergarten, and first grade students are off to a great start learning both English language arts, Spanish language arts, and math and Spanish. Bronco parents are looking forward to a PTC sponsored parents night out on September 22nd, a fun fundraiser for their students. For Twin Oaks, last week they had their first spirit day. It was a red, white, and blue themed day on September 11th. Their primary classes are exploring and studying all things apples. Their upper grade student leadership met last week. They look forward to the leaders of the pack and the new ideas and student perspective that they will bring to the campus. Tuesday, the Love and Logic Parenting Services had its first class. Registration continues to be open for all Rockland families. This Friday night, the PTC Wolfpack is hosting a family night, movie night. Also, Connor Paduska, a Rockland High School student, presented the Twin Oaks staff with a safety backpack full of supplies. They were so happy that he chose Twin Oaks for his service project. Thank you again, Connor. Events are in full swing at Sunset Ranch. Their students and staff are gearing up for their annual fun run hosted by their amazing PTC. Their goal for the event that takes place on Friday, 9:22, is $40,000, and they are over halfway there. This is a huge event with lots of parent and WHS student volunteers, and it is one of their students' favorite events. They also have their fall book fair coming up the week of 9:25, and they have their kinder students heading to Bishop's Pumpkin Patch at the beginning of October for their first field trip of the year. Clubs are in full swing in Bulldog Country. Students have the option to participate in Bulldog Theater Arts, Cross Country, Little Lego, Set Design, and Wind Down Wednesday. Rockland Elementary will also be having their first pause assembly, followed by the annual fun run this Friday. Rock Creek had a great PD day on Monday, September 18th, that involved analyzing school data, learning more about behavior theory, and best practices in math instruction. They are hosting their monthly coffee with the principal on Friday, September 22nd, which allows for families to meet each other, share ideas, and ask questions about Rock Creek. They are looking forward to their Red Hawk run on September 29th, and their fourth grade is looking forward to participating in a touch of understanding on October 3rd, an immersive experience in learning about different disabilities. Springview academics and curricular activities are in full swing. The Garden and Photography Club are highly attended by students. Their volleyball, flag football, and cross-country teams are competitive in their league. Friday, September 22nd, is their first annual family picnic during both lunches. The jazz band will also be playing. That same night is their first leadership planned event, a Barbie-themed dance. Um, Rockland High School has had an incredibly positive start to the school year with lots of fun activities built in to their school year, including an all-school carnival, welcome back rally, and dance, as well as 
Club Rush on August 31st to help connect students to someone or something on their campus. They are adjusting into their new flex schedule, which offers intervention and enrichment time that allow both student and staff selection. Course offerings during flex include specific course intervention makeup, general study hall time, as well as enrichment activities such as mindfulness, yoga, robotics, garden club, college rep visits, and AP test prep. They are gearing up for hosting the Cory Bowl next Friday night, September 29th, followed by homecoming week. Whitney had its fall club rush on September 13th, which was a huge success. This year, we have over 70 active clubs on our campus, and all of them are looking forward to getting started. The leadership program is excited to collaborate with our elementary feeder schools for their annual fun runs. Also, the leadership program is putting on its first ever community pep rally to highlight our youth football, football, flag football, band, cheer, and dance programs. We are excited for the 13th annual Cory Bowl game, which will be held at Rockland High School on Friday, September 29th. Lastly, our homecoming theme this year is Whitney is out of this world. The Spirit Week includes a Mr. WHS competition, dress-up days, lunchtime activities, giveaways, a school-wide rally, the homecoming football game, which features a parade, and a homecoming dance with the theme of Wish Upon a Star. It's safe to say that Whitney is rolling. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. A lot going on. It sounds very exciting. All right, now to item 7.2, comments from board and superintendent. Uh, trustees, do you have board comments you would like to share? Yeah, sure. Uh, thank you very much. Great to hear about all the amazing activities and events that are going on at all the schools. It's always it's fun to hear from up here. You don't you don't realize all the different things and all the and all the activities and how they all play out. So uh, I, I do feel bad for the poor principal who was duct taped and slimed, but <laughs> amazing, great for the kids to have that yes. fun. Uh, thank you to it was a it was a great week. I think mean, last week with the athletic committee going through all those different things. It's it was interesting to learn how all the different how, how the funding how the activities. How, how the policies, how all of this stuff fits together. It was, it, you don't realize what a complex web you think just simple high school athletics are, but the, and, and the policy. So it, it was great to hear that. Um, the facilities master plan, we went through that. It was good to hear just the different activities, ideas, hear about the wish list, hear about the different things from each school, how they all plan together, how, like, and, and I'm sure you'll hear it, you know, how, how we have more wants than, than funding. And, and I guess as I look at Marty, I, I know it's just welcome to, Public education in the state of California, but we'll we'll work through that. And then uh, a real quick shout out because it was the event right before here. Uh, my shout out to Springview Middle School flag football seventh grade team. They uh, they got tied up with Antelope Crossing. They tied, but they end up losing to overtime. So good to, good to watch some kids out there having fun. Sorry, Marty, or I'll, I'll go. Haley, tell us about what your plans are for next year. Um, so I want to go to a university. Um, college applications are due yeah. November 30th, <laughs> and January is Common App. So just looking forward to getting those in and not having that stress anymore. But yeah. Yeah, hangs over your head. I, yeah. I hear you, but good for you. Congratulations, and be sure you keep us in the loop with where you decide to apply and how things go, and of if course. there's anything we can do to help you. Yeah. Thank you for your report. It's awesome to hear how many great things are happening. I just wanted to share um, really the highlight because – my kids laugh at me, but I actually believe that um, funerals are a wonderful reminder to us all of what is truly important. And we had a beautiful memorial for Brenda Meadows, who served as Superintendent Stock's administrative assistant for nine years. And um, it was a wonderful celebration. It was great to hear so many different parts of her life. Um, Superintendent Stock spoke and did a beautiful job uh, representing all of us here at the district. And um, just a really great way to celebrate Brenda, and we, we miss her, but we are so grateful that we were able to be part of that and support her family. Um, that was really the highlight, actually, of my week. It was a wonderful service. Um, yeah, so I would just um, echo what Trustee Counter brought up with the facilities master plan study session. So it was a long meeting. Um, I think we only had one member of the public that came for a 
Leadership Rockland activity, um, but I found it to be a really valuable learning experience. Um, you know, we're given this huge packet. It talks about all the different campuses and, you know, it looks really dry, but it actually was really interesting. We had a consultant here. Um, we had Craig Rouse from the district to talk about just all of the intricacies of this. Um, you know, we learn about the budget, and um, Barbara Patterson goes over that so well, but seeing how it really applies, what I felt was very valuable and just helped me to understand everything that goes into keeping this district running. Um, I did have, kind of as we're thinking about, you know, different things, and they had us doing these interactive activities, and they asked us, well, you know, what do you think the parent perception of schools are and you know so we all kind of okay well you know the parents I've talked to think this and we maybe kind of infer this and um, so I was just thinking you know we've had some parent advisory kind of committees in the past like I think there was a superintendent's committee um, you know we used to get I don't I actually don't know if this still happens I don't think so um, the PTC presidents from the different schools would come and they would meet and you know, as we were talking about the different needs of different schools, I think looking into some ways to kind of get some of that feedback going again would be maybe be helpful. Um, and I know that now that we're getting some of our parent advisory committees going, there were a lot of parents who expressed interest and there just wasn't enough room in these committees for them to get a space. So maybe there is some room, I know, you know, they received a letter, if, if some opportunity arises, if people drop out, we'll let you know. Um, but we can maybe look at, and I probably don't even know all of the different committees that we've had, but I do know, um, like there was the Superintendent Advisory Committee. I had served on one, the Equity and Inclusivity Events Committee, which was cool. We helped to put on Hispanic Heritage Month events, um, talked about getting Best Buddies going, which um, came about to help students with disabilities build relationships. It's a large organization, things like that. Um, so maybe at the least we could get that list of parents who didn't get a space and let each principal kind of know that those parents had interests and help. It just seems like an untapped resource. So um, that got me thinking about that. Um, Otherwise, I don't really have anything other than this Friday, um, Chris and I are going to the Cory Trail Parent Dinner Auction, which will be our first kind of Cory Trail Parent event. So excited about that. Uh, I just, a quick echo for all of the hard work for our uh, facilities master plan board study session. Um, I know those don't magically happen, so I wanted to say a public thank you to all of the staff that put in, I'm sure were the many, many, many hours um, for us to sit there for three hours. I'm sure that was uh, multiplied at least tenfold. So uh, thank you to the staff for taking the time to do that, though. It's important work, right, to make sure that our facilities are up to date and that um, we are able to meet the needs of our students and our staff. And so thank you to the staff that put forth their work on that. I know that is just the beginning of uh, many, many hopefully great projects to come. Uh, additionally, I just uh, wanted to say a shout out to our students that I saw out at Hot Chili Cold Cars. It's always fun when you're out at a city event um, and you see students serving and volunteering and, and playing different instruments. And so uh, it, just, it just makes my heart smile uh, when I see our students actively engaging in our community. So just a shout out to City of Rockland leadership, Rockland Chamber that put that event on uh, for always finding ways to incorporate students and the great work that they're doing out in the community. Um, and then I also wanted to highlight, um, I, I didn't think I heard it mentioned yet, I was able to attend our PCOE Placer County Office of Education annual update uh, where they give out the annual report. Uh, and there's so many phenomenal statistics I could say. Um, but you know, Rockland is, is a large part of the phenomenal work happening in schools here in Placer County of the 74,000 plus students, uh, 11,400 and some of those are ours. Um, and at that annual update, we heard about many phenomenal things happening uh, in our district and what really sets Placer apart from the rest of the state. Um, but most notable was we celebrated that Placer County officially ranks its students first in the entire state for English language arts standards and third in the entire state for math standards. 
that is absolutely phenomenal and deserves being commended. Um, and so I just wanted to say a public shout out again to our staff, uh, to our families, to our students that are doing the phenomenal work, um, and also to our Placer County Office of Education leadership uh, for bringing this data to us. I think it's important for us to annually look at how we're doing um, meeting the needs of our students, um, but to celebrate when we have some of these high markers that we hit. All right, I love being last. There's already so much that was said. <laughs> There's not much left to say, but I will thank all those that stood in for uh, missing people tonight, um, including Bill and Marty and Matt. Thank you for standing in and, and picking up the slack. And um, another thank you to Heather for her RTPA report. It was much appreciated and it, it was very thoughtful and I appreciate the comments that you made and I hope we can move forward with some of the things that you said. All right, Superintendent Stock. Well, I uh, just wanted to start by uh, just again uh, commending uh, Chief Banks and his leadership and the city's leadership for the just partnership we have. And, and also, I know it was mentioned that uh, our Associate Superintendent of Secondary Education, Marty Flowers, plays a role. Um, he did, plays a tremendous role, and he does a lot of that, not just during the workday, but beyond to be a part of the foundation, to be involved in, and I know it's uh, just as deep care for the community, but I just wanted to acknowledge his role that really makes our partnership go deeper. And just also share what Chief Bankston is, there are many times that it's 11 o'clock at night, four in the morning, whenever, that we are working uh, behind the scenes to collaborate on making sure things are safe, running down a rumor, doing out welfare checks, but in a supportive way. And so we're so fortunate to have uh, just the level of support we do um, and with them. Uh, also, just as if you didn't know, uh, you should, but September 28th, next uh, Thursday, is our first parent university at Rockland High School from 6 to 7.30. We have hundreds of parents signed up already, and we encourage you to come out. It really is a choose-your-own-adventure. There's multiple offerings, and you can choose what you're interested in, and it's designed for parents from... Uh, preschool all the way through uh, high school. So we encourage you to come out. Uh, also, big next Friday night, uh, September 29th, I won't ask you who you think is going to win, but we have our annual Cory Bowl held at Rockland High School this year. And it's great when we get about 5,000 people in the community that want to come out and, and celebrate uh, just, just a great uh, rivalry game, but is done with such great sportsmanship from our student body presidents, to do a joint address all the way down to our players, coaches, and it's one of my favorite events of the year, so we're excited for that. And get tickets fast because they're, they go really quick. Um, and then also uh, just wanted to just uh, reach out uh, also that we, uh, just so grateful, I know the Meadows family was for just the strong support from our current trustees, previous trustees, and, and staff to just honor, honor her memory. And, um, and, and it was uh, just an, an outstanding ceremony to do so. So, so deeply appreciative of everyone involved with that. Um, and I'll turn it back to you. All right, we will now move on to item 8.1, the consent calendar. All matters listed under the consent calendar are to be considered routine and will be enacted by one motion followed by a roll call vote. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless the Board of Trustees Audience or staff request specific items to be removed from the consent calendar for separate discussion and action. Any items removed will be voted upon following the motion to approve the consent calendar. Does any trustee wish to remove an item from the consent calendar for separate discussion or action? Is there a motion to approve consent agenda items? So moved. Okay, first by Trustee Price. Is there a second? Second. Second by Trustee Counter. Georgia, will you please call the roll? Nayeli Glode. Yes. Derek Counter. Yes. Tiffany Sadoff. Yes. Rochelle Price. Yes. Michelle Sutherland. Yes. Julie Hub. Yes. Motion passes. Now to item 9.1. We will hold a public hearing and action on resolution 232403, a resolution affirming sufficient textbooks and instructional materials for 2023-2024, 
Bill McDonald, Associate Superintendent, Elementary Education. Good evening again, trustees. Uh, consistent with California Education Code 60119, the Rockland Unified School District is required to hold a public hearing and adopt a resolution affirming that each pupil in the school district has sufficient textbooks or instructional materials in specific subjects that are aligned to the academic content standards and consistent with the content and cycles of the curriculum frameworks adopted by the state of California. At this time, we attest that the Rockland Unified School District has sufficient textbooks and instructional materials, and we are asking the board to adopt a resolution affirming this. Thank you. Board, are there any comments or questions? I just wanted to ask um, about this in regards to you know some of the complaints that had come through earlier, the Williams complaints. Can you kind of talk about just kind of what goes into making kind of this certification? Um, like say, you know, now we are in the process of looking at a science, an elementary science curriculum. So what do you kind of weigh um, to make this decision? So each year when we open school, we, um, we have to order textbooks or get textbooks in. So what we do is we affirm with every principal in sight that we have sufficient textbooks. And the materials actually can be electronic as well. So we have to look at both of those, both at you know in K-12. And um, we would ensure that in mathematics, social studies, science, uh, health, world language, we have curricular materials, either digital or hard copies, both at school and at home available to students. So we go through that process each year and then we give you this report affirming that that's in place. Um, you asked specifically about how science is K-5 science right now is looking. So we do have a current science adoption. Um, it's an older adoption, but um, we still have those textbooks available in our classrooms. We also have a supplemental science curriculum, which is mystery science, available to all K-5. Um, that curriculum is NGS aligned to the new content standards. Um, we've also purchased um, hands-on materials that go along with that curriculum for 90% of the teachers at that grade level and provided NGSS training to those teachers as well last spring. Um, and then, correct, we are currently in the midst of a science adoption process. Um, that will conclude hopefully in December and we'll be able to make a recommendation to the board in January. So we're actively seeking to adopt a new K-5 science curriculum. So the hands-on materials, those go along with the existing curriculum or the mystery science? Those are a complement to the mystery science curriculum. So okay. they allow for the teachers to go deeper into those units that are part of that curriculum. Okay. And what was the cost for that? Uh, the costs for the hands-on materials was approximately $75,000. For all, and so that gives all the students access to that, okay. In and K that's, yep. with the, that's including the mystery science? The, the license for mystery science is an additional $20,000. Okay, but they have that for this Is this, this the year. first year they've had mystery science? Or we've had that for a long time? We've had mystery science, we started in the pandemic, so I think yeah. this is the third okay. year. Thank yeah. you. This is the first year we've bought the hands-on materials that complement the program. And I see that that was for the teachers that, that was for teachers that requested them, and so 90% of our teachers wanted those? Yeah, we, had about a, we have about 180 teachers in K-5, and we had, I think, 160 of them requested oh, the that's, materials. That's awesome. Really great, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Any other questions or comments? Okay. I now open the public hearing for resolution 232403, affirming sufficient textbooks and instructional materials for 2324. I have one public comment. Um, Price Johnson, please come to the microphone. Uh, thank you, Superintendent, for that breakdown. It's good to know a little bit more about how that works. Um, my comments and questions tonight are not for this board. Um, this board has made it clear that they come to the table, minds already decided, and, and ears not open to community uh, concerns. My comments and, and questions tonight are for the greater Rockland community and, and public. Um, I don't know what district, what city, what state, what country, what planet Curriculum and textbooks from 2008 is considered an appropriate standard. 
I don't know how that meets our promise of educational excellence. And I think it's telling that 90% of our teachers requesting new hands-on materials is telling that our teachers are hungry for this material. I have heard from far too many teachers and faculty and PTC members this last few weeks that are just bamboozled by the decisions that this board has made to remove the science curriculum from this year. Science curriculum that was vetted for two years by educators, by faculty, by parents. There was a petition of over 800 parents that agreed that were, that were up, upset that you were removing this policy or taking a vote to remove this policy, and you ignored that petition. All you received in exchange was a new committee of three parents that now have less than a year to vet five new science curriculums, because it doesn't even include the Amplify Science curriculum, which you asked to pause. Ms. Hupp, you characterized this as a policy pause so we could explore a new curriculum. You then proceeded to remove it from the five that we'd be removing, so reviewing. So it doesn't even make sense that the most vetted curriculum wouldn't be included in one of those five curriculums. So I'm just asking you to do better, and I'm asking for the public to really consider next year the two seats that are available for, for this board to select candidates that will put curriculum first and education first for our okay, students, that's for our time. teachers, Thank you, Price. for our parents. Thank you all. Shame on this right. board. Have a good evening. Okay, so I don't have any other green cards or comments. Well, we already did before the comments. Did you? But you can say more. You can say whatever you want. Are there any more comments from the board or questions? Um, Superintendent Stock, I, I, I have heard and read online several times um, that when we were looking at the science curriculum that that was a removal of science curriculum from the classrooms. Can you clarify if that was an adoption process or a removal of a previously approved curriculum? Uh, there was no uh, removal of any uh, previously board approved curriculum from classrooms. It was a recommendation uh, for, for new science curriculum to be adopted, um, but there was no removal of, of, of previous approved curriculum. Okay, so it was a curating process of what new curriculum could we look at as an option? Correct. Okay, thank you. I just want clarification. Yeah, thank you for clarifying that. I've heard that um, inaccurate thing reported many times. All right, so we will now close the public hearing. And is there a motion to approve resolution 232403 affirming sufficient textbooks and instructional materials for 2324? So moved. Okay, first by Trustee Price. Is there a second? Second. Second by Trustee Counter. Georgia, will you please call the roll? Derek Counter. Yes. Tiffany Sadoff. Yes. Michelle Price? Yes. Michelle Sutherland? Yes. Julie Hupp? Yes. Motion passes. So next we have Barbara Patterson, Deputy Superintendent, Business and Operations, to present item 9.2, Action on Resolution number 232407, Establishing Appropriation Limitation, GAN Limit for 2324. Uh, good evening, President Hupp, Board of Trustees, and Superintendent Stock. Ed Code Section 4132 specifies that the School District Governing Board shall adopt a resolution identifying the estimated appropriation limits in the current year and the actual appropriation limits for the preceding year. This uh, was put into Ed Code intended to constrain yearly spending uh, by linking year-to-year -year changes in expense to changes in inflation and population. The district's revised GAN limit for 2023 is uh, $102,045,570.62, and the budget GAN limit for 2324 is $103,880,011.19. So I ask that you approve this resolution. Are there any board comments or questions? So I, just to do the, the quick math, we will cover the debt by $1.8 the debt? Well, well, we plan to spend 102 million 40, you know that, and we'll have 103,880. So we've got 1.8 million in float, right? 
there's some there are some expenditures that are included and some expenditures are that are excluded. budget. Oh, yes. okay, excluded. Okay. Yeah. Okay. In this calculation, it's a very mechanical calculation. Are there any other board comments or questions? Okay, thank you very much, Barbara. Is there a motion to approve resolution, resolution number 232407, establishing appropriation limitation GAN limit for 2324? So moved. First by Trustee Counter. Is there a second? Second. Second by Trustee Sutherland. Georgia, will you please call the roll? Derek Counter? Yes. Tiffany Sadoff? Yes. Rochelle Price? Yes. Michelle Sutherland? Yes. Julie Hupp. Yes. Motion passes. Thank you very much. And now we'll ask Barbara Patterson uh, to continue with item 9.3-22-23 unaudited actuals financial statements. Thank you. Um, I'm going to quickly take this opportunity to thank everyone who uh, was involved in uh, preparing the uh, and out of the actuals in closing the books on a um, timely and uh, proper manner. That included school office staff, department, other department staff, and I just especially want to thank uh, Beth Parrish, who is our Director of Fiscal Services and in here with me tonight, and a special thanks to our um, accounting staff in our department, because they all worked really hard on this, so I thank them. Um, the district is required to submit the unaudited actual reports for the previous fiscal year to the Placer County Office of Education and California Department of Education each September. So um, tonight I'll present in summary form the general funds unaudited actuals for 22-23 and major changes since estimated actuals. Um, the required an odd actual SACS report that we're, we're required to submit to the county and the state. Um, have more detailed information for you, and it's included in the board packet as well for information. Uh, the estimated actuals accompanied in the 23 24 adopted budget that the board approved and staff submitted to Plaster County Office in the state in June are, is what we're showing the differences to tonight. Um, I'll also review a significant accounting adjustment that affects the unaudited actuals and factors that will affect um, the budget assumptions going forward and uh, finally what's ahead in reports to the board on financial activity and projections. So uh, we are here in September on our budget cycle uh, for our unaudited actuals. Uh, finishing up the reporting for 2022-23. The final financial report on activity in 22-23 will be the audit report, which is planned to be presented in December. This is the second year that uh, we've had a significant uh, difference between the actual cash balance in our cash and county treasury and the investment value at June 30th. So if there's not a significant uh, difference, we don't have to book an accounting entry, entry but um, Governmental County Standards Board does require this entry. So this year, we did have to book um, a reduction um, of $1.3 million. Obviously, this is um, not a realized loss unless we were to take all of our money out of the cash and county treasury, but just um, a requirement. Um, for our unaudited actuals, and when we're presenting to the board for our interim reports, we'll be reversing this in July, so you'll see our actual balances. This is a summary of the general fund activity for 2022-23. This is where we ended up. The district spent $164.8 million in 22-23 and a recognized $175.9 million in revenue. Um, you can see on the third line, contributions to restricted programs. The district contributed to three restricted programs um, from unrestricted funds to cover the expenditures, uh, $18.5 million to special education, that's including uh, mental health special edu education, uh, uh, 4.7 million to routine restricted maintenance and 195,000 to junior ROTC programs. 
So you can see um, a, a big uh, in reason for the um, excess revenues or expenditures, again, are the one-time uh, state uh, funding um, that we received. And so we have an excess of revenue over expenditures of $11 million. And um, then you can see our components of ending fund balance here as well. And we can talk, we'll can we talk about um, the reasons for those changes next. So uh, a couple pages ahead, you'll see um, in numerical form the, the changes from estimated actual to actual and unrestricted and restricted. Um, here you can see the major changes. We received a dividend from Schools Insurance Group in June of $414,000. Um, we also had a decrease in our contribution to uh, our special education program of uh, 709000 uh, We had a decrease in our bill back for services from PCOE and also in our expenditures for our non public school education uh, cost and our non-public agency cost. Um, and uh, our legal fees came in less than expected. We also, um, if you remember, we, we received a, uh, the Arts, Music, and Instructional Materials Grant, and the board adopted a plan in October, and then in January they told us they were going to cut it. And then in May, they changed the amount again. And then in state adopted, they changed the amount again. So uh, the good news is uh, they gave some money back to us uh, in the state adopted budget. So we had originally already spent the money um, in the uh, arts, music, and instructional materials. So we were going to have to backfill that with unrestricted general fund money of about a million and a half. So we were able to keep that in unrestricted uh, general fund with the reduction in the final cut. Um, we also had um, late in June, we received almost, a, uh, we received a million dollars in restricted grants. So we received uh, the kitchen infrastructure and training funds for um, our nutrition services and um, reef innovation grants. And then, uh, so the flip side on the um, arts, music, construction materials block grant, and then as well as the uh, learning recovery emergency block grant, both of those um, reductions didn't um, didn't end up being as much as we thought it may revise. So you can see we added back $3.1 million in revenue um, on the AMIM grant and then $878,000 back to the learning recovery block grant. So that was good news in the state adopted budget. And we reckon, even though that those grants um, can be spent over multiple years, we recognize all of that revenue in the current uh, year, 22-23. Barbara, can I ask a quick question sure. about that? So even if it can be spread over multiple years, then do we just, whatever we spend in this year, whatever's left over is then put into the next year's budget and so on and so forth? Right, so it'll be in fund balance, and then you'll just see the expenditures hitting in the out years, but it won't match the revenues. So revenues are this year, and you'll see the expenditures in the, each year that we spend the money. So um, again, these are the changes from estimated actuals that were presented to you in June and, um, and presented by major category, um, unrestricted, restricted revenues and expenditures. Um, and again, we reviewed the uh, major changes of to, as to why that occurred. And then this is the changes of components in fund balance. Um, and again, really what dropped the bottom line in the reserve for economic uncertainty was that SIG dividend 
the um, the one the amount we didn't have to put into the arts and music instructional back uh, block grant to backfill that, and then the decrease in the special ed contribution. So that's the major um, change there. And then looking forward for this fiscal year, major factors to watch going forward. Uh, so we had our enrollments came in higher than projected. Uh, we came in um, a 60, 169 at 10-day warm body count, 169 over prior year CBEDS, and 61 over our projections. So our adopted budget had a projection of 108, and we had another 61. So that was wonderful news. Um, and then uh, for attendance, 83% of the district's general fund revenues are uh, driven by ADA. And so that can vary from year to year. And it has not, the attendance rate has not returned to our pre-COVID levels. So actual attendance uh, rates may vary and impact our, our future state funding. Special education funding and costs can fluctuate significantly significantly throughout the year, depending on students that are in the program or identified, move in, um, and our costs, uh, when, whether we're covering for um, positions that we can't fill, so we have to go outside, and that's a higher cost to, to um, contract for. And then the governor's budget proposal that comes out in January will obviously impact our multi-year, so we'll be presenting a multi-year to the board at first interim. Um, factors like the cost of living adjustment that we've um, that the Department of Finance has built into the 2023-24 adopted budget for the out years um, are likely to change. Pension rates um, will there be any more one-time funding? Um, state and federal economies are strong right now, but who's to say what's coming in the future? So uh, next steps. Our independent auditors will be here shortly uh, to audit our financial statements for um, the 2022-23 year. We're working hard on getting ready for them coming in October. Uh, the first interim report will be presented to the board uh, in December at the December meeting. And then the audit report is due by January 31st, but um, our hope is to present that in December. So. That concludes my presentation. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, are there any questions or comments? As always. Thank you, Barbara. Uh, how you do what you do and compile everything you do with you and your team uh, and the many, many changes that we see from the state. Thank you for how you uh, compile that into an easy to read and understand slide deck for um, our families watching. Um, I did want to just highlight slide seven, uh, the Reef Innovation Grant, having uh, served uh, on the board in the past. Um, I know how um, incredible it is and beneficial it is to have our Rockland Educational Excellence Foundation supporting the great work of the district. Um, and so I hope it's okay to do a quick little plug, but uh, I, I, I was counting when the next meeting would be. And um, I, I know, uh, again, having served on that board, how important the annual Starlight Soirée is. Uh, that's what helps fund these grants. Um, and so October 12th, anybody listening, is the 2023 um, Starlight Soirée. And so just, again, a shout out to thank Reef, um, but I know that that annual event is a not only a beautiful event that brings the community together, uh, the funds raised at that event is what supplies these grants. And so we're seeing in real life, real time, the effects of previous Starlight Soria events. And so uh, I look forward to attending and hopefully we can rally the community to support the great cause uh, because it's moments like this that we get to celebrate the great work of our community coming together and the great support of Reef. So thank you. Any other comments or questions? Okay, thank you so much, Barbara. Is there a motion to approve the 22-23 unaudited actuals financial statements? So moved. First by Trustee Counter. Is there a second? Second. Second by Trustee Sadoff. Georgia, will you please call the roll? Derek Counter. Yes. Tiffany Sadoff. Yes. Rochelle Price. Yes. Michelle Sutherland. Yes. Julie Hupp. Yes. Motion passes. Thank you so much.
And I now invite Marty Flowers, Associate Superintendent, Secondary Education and Educational Services to present item 10.1, Rockland Unified School District World Language Pilot and Curriculum Adoption Recommendation for Spanish. President Hupp, Trustees, Superintendent Stock, good evening again. Uh, the presentation you're about to see is gonna look very familiar. Again, I appreciate the board for approving the French curriculum at the end of last year. So uh, I am proud to say uh, that the Spanish teachers did do a very similar proce process and they went through and looked at the first two and with student feedback and teacher feedback, uh, they didn't settle. Uh, so they did choose to go out a third time and that's why I'm bringing this forward tonight as an information item and then I'll see you again in November. But with that, a uh, quick overview of the adoption process, the committee work and recommendation, the public review process, and then next steps. Uh, once again, the state of California uh, has a regular schedule to update these frameworks, and then from that, the publishers use these frameworks to create the curriculum, and then school districts follow a similar timeline. Uh, in this timeline, you could see that the State Board of Education in January of 2019 adopted the world language standards for public schools. In July of 2020, the framework, and then we started our process. And again, you can see there uh, in October and November of 22, uh, we looked at uh, one set of curriculum, and then we looked at a second set, and again at that time they did not settle, so we chose uh, to go out a third time and take a look. And that's the recommendation I'm bringing uh, before you this evening. And then once again, we will start the public review process immediately. And then uh, I'll come back in front of you again in November asking for approval. Uh, with that, the committee did do an amazing amount of work. And, and again, I, I would be remiss to not mention uh, program specialist Amanda Bannister just does a fabulous job leading this work. And I appreciate her for her dedication to that. With this, the, the group did spend one day looking at the standards and frameworks, uh, two days looking at curriculum options, using a variety of workshops. And again, this toolkit comes from the state board as far as how do you go through and look at this curriculum. They did identify the curriculum, and then we did participate in those pilots. Again, uh, parents of students participating receive a letter to let them know. We did that throughout last school year, uh, and then we did further. And then, uh, again, at the direction of the board, um, during that time, uh, updated policy to include parents. We did include uh, two parents that the principals recommended this year, uh, one parent that had uh, a number of students go through uh, Springview and Whitney High School, uh, the last of four children uh, currently participating as a junior in Spanish. And then the other parent has a student uh, in seventh grade at Springview and then a ninth grader at Whitney High School. So they did participate, and again, I thank the board for that direction there. Um, with that, I do come forward, and, and I, I am embarrassed to say that I never did take Spanish, but uh, bosses, I believe, uh, digital, and this is like much of the new curriculum. It's uh, with, with uh, our students have one-to-one -one Chromebooks. Uh, the curriculum's available online, but as always, we'll have printed copies available in the classroom as well. In regards to the public review process per California Ed Code. It is recommended that we um, uh, provide this for a minimum of 30 days, and once again, we'll start that process tomorrow. And then Rockland Unified School District is committed to making the recommended, recommended materials available to parents, teachers, staff members, and anyone interested. And again, I wanna thank Amanda Bannister for doing that. Um, we will start with a, the website, and the website is actually our world language website. So you'll have information on there about the new French curriculum, uh, Spanish, as well as our American Sign Language. We do offer three uh, languages in, in this district. So parents will be informed via email starting tomorrow morning. They can go onto the website. They will have access to level one and level two to review all that material. And then staff will be uh, available to answer any questions. And similar to the board's direction last year, information is there for any feedback. We'd love to have that feedback. And then um, that'll lead to our next steps. As I mentioned previously on November 15th, we'll come back uh, asking the, uh, the board for a final approval on that. If the curriculum recommendations are approved at no the November 15th board meeting, uh, that'll be purchased, professional development will be scheduled, and then ongoing support for our teachers. And, and once again, just a shout out to all of our teachers and to our students that participated last year to make the best recommendation coming forward. 
Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you, Marty. Are there any board comments or questions? That's okay. Uh, thank you, Marty, and thank you for uh, verbally highlighting um, about the change in the parent participation, because um, I know there was uh, quite a bit of extensive conversation last year, uh, really last two years, um, but about uh, the difference between parent reviewing in a pilot um, and parents participating in the selection before the materials go to pilot. Um, so thank you for, for sharing that verbally. Uh, I would like to make a request that in the future, if we could try to include that in the written presentation, because uh, some um, individuals in the community might just refer to the, the written presentation and not hear the verbal comments. Um, my suggestion would be like maybe on slide five, um, but again, with that change being that it's no longer just parent review after the pilot um, or in the middle of the pilot, um, but that they're actually uh, were part of the selection process. Thank you. Very good. Any other comments? No, thank you. Uh, there was a lot going through kind of the the different criteria that they looked at and um, just seeing how it's laid out online. I, I don't know. I took Spanish at Rockland High a long time ago, but I know it seems like things have really progressed as far as just the way that people learn, you know, I can't say that I retained a whole lot, you know, from back then, and I, but I think now with the different, um, you know, digital assistance that they have for listening and talking and, you know, the way they use apps, um, yeah, it, it looks very, very interesting, and I appreciate kind of seeing all the different facets that um, kind of go into deciding whether a curriculum kind of meets standards or not for our teachers. All right, thank you very much. I have next Hana, but is that right? Okay, so we have Hana Anderson, Director of Innovation, School Programs and Accountability to present the Attendance Improvement Plan and Update. Good evening, President Hupp, trustees, Superintendent Stock. I am here tonight to share about our attendance improvement plan that we have launched this school year. Uh, during the presentation, we will share about the improvement process that has led us to goals and actions. We'll share the impact that attendance makes on our student achievement data. I will share with you um, the goals and planned actions this school year and discuss next steps. The lower left graph in this slide, albeit small, I'll just give you a big picture. Um, you, uh, it shows the average daily attendance. So this is the percent that students participate in school. So what you can see is that historically, before uh, and up through the 2019-20 school year, our district average daily attendance was between 95% to 97%. So we overall had a quite high attendance rate in the school district, which is exceptional. Uh, in the 2020-2021 school year, attendance was not captured. That was when um, the pandemic shutdown happened. At the 2021-22 school year, um, across the state of California and across the country, we, there was uh, an understandable dip in attendance. However, um, we dropped into the 93% attendance rate, and then we are making steady um, progress forward. We trended up. Um, a, a little over a percent. We want to continue to see um, that attendance trend in a positive direction so that students are receiving instruction in our schools. The upper right hand graph um, shows a similar historical pattern, but as um, uh, Deputy Superintendent Patterson shared earlier, we are we are funded based on the number of students that actually attend our schools, not the number of students that are enrolled in our schools. And so the blue line in this graph shows you the number of students that are enrolled. The red line by year shows you the number of students that we were funded to serve. And so what you can see is a similar pattern in that the discrepancy between the blue and the red line is smaller pre-2019-20 school year and then it grows larger in the last couple of years as our attendance rate has decreased. We also are seeing a, a pattern of chronic absenteeism across our district, across the state and the country. What chronic absenteeism means is that 10%, students are missing 10% or more of the school year. 
To put that in context, we have 180 school days in every school year. If a student misses 18 school days, that is considered chronically absent. And I think when we consider 18 as a total number, it, doesn't, it seems hard to get there. But that's a little less than two days per month. So if we consider that if a student is just absent two days per month, they are what's considered chronically absent. Um, and that is a significant um, barrier to achieve at high levels. And I'll get into that in the next slide. And so what we saw, again, similar patterns, 2018-19, we had a chronic absenteeism rate of 8.2%. So as historically, we, since this has been being tracked, we are under 10% as a school district. We went to almost 20% during the 2021-22 school year. This is an understandable number given that students were being asked to, to um, stay home when ill or had any symptoms. This number is coming down. We saw that we were just um, at 13.6% last year. We want to continue to see that number come down. Um, because when we're cresting almost to that 20% marker, that means that one out of every five kids in our school was considered chronically absent, missed that 18 days of school. In context, Rockland Unified is still doing quite well in this area and compared to the state of California, but we can do better um, and make sure that our students are here and make sure that they know the importance of being here so that they can participate in learning and make connections with their peers. This slide uh, gives a, a little uh, preview of uh, student achievement data from last spring. What this slide shows is that when students are here in attendance, so in regular attendance in our schools, they outperform uh, students that are not in regular attendance in math by 23% on the CASP assessment. So students in our district that regularly attend school outperform students who don't regularly attend school by 23% in math and by 14% in reading. We also have similar data that we can look at with our reading achievement for grades K, 1, and 2. This is based on classroom-based assessments that are given by classroom teachers in kindergarten, first, and second grade that measure um, readiness for reading and reading level. So students who regularly attend kindergarten outperform students who miss two days per month by 17% in reading. In first grade, that gap increases to 24%. So we know that attendance matters in transitional kindergarten and in kindergarten. They are building those foundational skills. They are learning to interact with their peers and they are um, achieving at higher rates in our schools, this is local data, in our schools when they are participating in the instructional setting. There's also a significant fiscal impact um, of enrollment and attendance. Um, this breaks down a lot of the charts, actually, that were shown in the um, in, uh, Deputy Superintendent's uh, presentation um, into simpler uh, terms that I know are a bit more comprehensible to those of us that don't live in the business world day in and day out. Um, so we know that we have seen a decline in our enrollment since the 2019-20 school year. And that decline in enrollment also has that fiscal impact. The district is projected this year to receive an average of $11,740 per average daily attendance. Um, in the 23-24 school year if we were to base our attendance on just single year data only. So that means that a loss of every 100 students to our district is approximately $1.1 million in funded ADA. It also means that when we calculate the loss of 1% each year, that is, or this past year would be $1.34 million. So 1% of attendance students not coming to school is $1.34 million. And then just context of a day, right? My, I just missed a day, What you know, it's okay. The average loss for every one day of attendance in Rockland Unified is $90 on average for students because we are funded as a school district when students are here at school 
or they are participating in independent study, or they are participating in home and hospital instruction. We are not funded for even excused absences, unfortunately, in the way that our ed code is written. So even excused absences that a doctor approves, those are not funded absences. Uh, the only attendance we receive is when students are uh, physically at school. And then uh, just another piece of, of data from last school year, short-term independent study generated approximately $650,000 during the 22-23 school year. And that data piece is significant for us because we truly want our families to be um, engaging in family activities. We hope that they do that during our school breaks because we know when students are at school, they are achieving. You saw that on the two previous slides. We also know that there are family realities that don't always match that schedule, and we want to make sure that our families are knowledgeable that independent study is an option, and that those are actually absences where the school district still receives funding to educate children. Can you, can I interrupt you right there? Can you clarify for our families what um, constitutes short-term independent study? Is that um, an absence of three days? Yes, okay. an absence of three uh, consecutive days, mm -hmm. but it can span a weekend, uh, constitutes short-term independent study. So if our families do need to do that, what do they need to do to be sure that they are dialed in with the independent study program? So they can request a short-term independent study contract through their school's attendance office. The attendance clerk or just front office staff can help them with that process. We do ask that all families uh, provide a, a, a Ideally, two weeks, because mm. classroom teachers like to be able to um, put together a reasonable um, level of work, yeah. and the classroom teacher is responsible for putting together that work. I am sure President Huff knows the laborious nature of an independent study packet, but it is, you know, even with, it is important to let us know and not have that two-week timeline be a barrier. We would like for families to be requesting if they are going to be out. Sometimes I know, even I've had friends of mine that said, oh, I'll just call them in sick and then it'll be okay. And, and so just know, you know, the, the, the independent study is an absence where we continue to receive funding for um, educating children. Thank you. Okay, so again, just to point out, that loss of every 1% of attendance is $1.34 million. So when training and thinking about this with our school clerks and our secretaries and our principals, I was thinking about how can we equate $1.34 million? So I had a little bit of fun with things that we really care about in our schools. Like we are always looking for things for students to play with on the playground. So can you believe it? We can get 268,000 playground balls if we increased attendance by 1%. We can also get 310,000 uh, thousand, a little over, reams of paper. That is a lot of paper airplanes that could potentially be thrown if you were my children. Um, we can uh, fund 67 part-time instructional assistants in our schools to support our students. That would be 29,000 hours of tutoring to help our students in need. And lastly, that would be nine intervention teachers that we could put into our schools. So when students come, we can serve them even better and continue um, to support their academic and social emotional growth. The trustees, an idea I had that um, I, I'm not putting into place because my, my colleagues uh, told me that it would not be a good idea, but is I thought we ought to send there every time we have an absence a $90 bill and invite you to donate back <laughs> so we can fund these things, but, um, but we aren't doing that. Uh -huh. No, we understand, too, that there are legitimate reasons for needing to be out of school. When students are legitimately sick, we do want them to be out of school and re resting and recuperating, and that is very important. We just want to take the opportunity also to educate that there are options if you truly are um, taking a family trip. Or um, Also, I should mention in that, and I'll, I'll get to this in a second, but we are funded when students attend school for the purpose of uh, or, or come to school for the purpose of attending. So if you come to school for the purpose of attending for an hour, and then you leave for a dentist appointment, and after the dentist appointment you aren't feeling well and you stay home the rest of the day, that is a day where we are funded to um, support your child. 
If you come to school for 10 minutes, you go into the classroom, you think you are feeling well, and then you get a headache and you go home. That is a day we are funded to support your child. If you walk through campus, that is not a day that we're funded to support your child. But if you do attend, right, like we would rather have your student come tardy than not come at all because building those healthy habits of regular school attendance is important for social emotional learning, for our mental health, and um, to be engaged, right? And then also for that academic learning. Okay, so we went through a continuous improvement process to think about this problem and not just immediately jump to solutions, right? We're committed to that continuous improvement. So in this process, we analyzed the problem and collaborated um, to understand this. We engaged with a work group of administrators, attendance clerks, our TPA, um, other school staff and PCOE staff. We met in May. We reviewed data and identified goals, focus areas, and potential action steps. We also worked, um, and we are in this phase right now, in education and communication, We're doing a little bit of education, um, hopefully, um, this evening. So we uh, have been engaging in attendance messaging at the beginning of this school year, and will, that will go on monthly throughout the year. Um, Superintendent Stock starred in a uh, attendance video at the beginning of the school year that was showed at back to school night, and we revised the attendance handbook for our um, school clerks. We are then engaged in a series of trainings. We trained all of our clerks and or administrators prior to the year starting, and we are providing ongoing support for our school staff throughout the year. And lastly, we're going to be um, putting in place interventions and improvement trials. I'll share about that in the coming slide. We have two goals that we're going to work on. The first is to increase district attendance uh, percentage by 1%. Um, going from 94.71% to 95.71%. So cresting back into that historical trend of between 95 and 97. I'd love to say we're gonna go more than that. I also know that we are still in a reality of you know, rebuilding those healthy habits and helping families know that, it's, that regular school attendance is what we're asking them to do, not the opposite. Then we um, are also looking to decrease chronic absenteeism, so decrease the number of students who miss 18 days or more by a minimum of 5%. So we wanna get ourselves back under that 10% marker to be in a healthier space with our attendance habits. Um, these attendance interventions, many have been put in place um, for many years. We're just re-engaging um, with these processes, ensuring that they're happening district-wide. You hear us talk a lot about MTSS and those tiered structures and supports. Some supports are for all kids. Some supports are for some kids, and some supports are for a few kids. Attendance works that exact same way. So there are certain practices that we do across the entire um, student body in the district. Like we inform our entire student body in their handbook and parents in their handbook and at back to school night about the importance of attendance. Right? We also will be sending communication through Parent Square, reaching out directly um, to parents when they're absent, right? You get a phone call if you're absent and you haven't cleared the absence. Um, we also um, send letters as required by Ed Code um, to parents and guardians when um, their students have truancy absences uh, or they are reaching excessive excused absences where they're going to start needing doctor verification. There's also those, some uh, supports are available for a few, so that is a school attendance review team meeting where we can help put in place interventions. I've had um, principals share with me, you know, they've purchased alarm clocks, they've worked with their incentive systems at schools to try to incentivize um, coming on time to school. They have conducted home visits for families to consider what are the barriers to attendance. So those are happening at the school site level with uh, district level support from um, Sarah Sorries or myself. And then the intensive supports are referring families to the School Attendance Review Board. That is one of our last resorts. It is a legal process through Placer County Office of Education and the, um, this would be in conjunction with the district attorney. We also though, uh, that we are fortunate to be in a county that believes in a network of care. And so at that uh, school attendance review board meeting, it is often a pathway to supports for families as well. It's not only seen as a punitive measure, but sometimes that is our last resort to say, we have tried all of these things. We have to get support in getting this student here because it's putting their 
um, further their future outcomes at risk when they're not here in our schools. Hannah, uh, can I just make one comment? This is amazing. I just wanted to add one idea about district-wide practices as families are getting you know, we're, we're given a lot of information as parents. Um, the communication through Parent Square happening frequently, as well as maybe having Chief Dosage include that on our on our social media, our Instagram, our Facebook pages, just a reminder to families about the importance and why we're working towards it and um, what our goals are. Thank you. You gave me a great segue, because that goes right into this next piece, where we are going to work this year on increasing our district-wide communication related to attendance, um, and we're going to target a few specific areas. So when we took that deep dive, we identified that there was a couple of focus areas we wanted to target. Historically, August and September have been great months for attendance for us. Everyone's excited to be back to the school. This is great. Um, November and December have been big dips. For us. So we're going to target a lot of our communication into these kind of and, um, the October month leading into that, uh, that dip time. We um, will also have targeted communication for specific grade levels. So we want to establish healthy attendance habits for our transitional kindergarten students and our kindergarten students and keep those healthy habits in first grade and on up. And so we are going to be doing some targeting messaging just to our TKK1 families about the importance of young children attending school regularly and building those healthy habits. And so that messaging um, will be coming out as well. And then um, this took place yesterday, but there's bi-monthly clerk training to just keep our clerks um, just able to be in constant communication if they have questions, they're able to get them answered. Our site-based teams will be meeting monthly and using our data tool um, to help them identify students who are on the cusp of that chronic absenteeism so they can try some early interventions with them. And those are pre-existing teams that meet, but we're just going to support them with the use of our data tool and um, help them um, with some possible interventions. We're also going to be communicating about our independent study options and um, monitoring our attendance rates ongoing, specifically for those dip months that we were looking at, um, and short-term independent study. I apologize. Third question in a row <laughs> from me. Um, do our teachers do anything? You know, are they given certificates? Are they giving kids awards for you know good attendance? So our teachers um, engage in the classroom, and many of our teachers have different, right, you know, different incentive doing protocols. It, yeah. One of the things we really want to be thoughtful about, though, is that sometimes 100% um, attendance can be, um, can be really difficult to attain for some students. And we don't want any one student to feel um, like they're letting their class down from earning something or like they didn't get something. Yeah. Not necessarily as a class, I'm sorry, just as individuals. Oh, know, yes, they... yes, yes, okay. absolutely. And we also have our, so, I'm sorry for misunderstanding, we also have our elementary schools and our middle schools using their PBIS incentive systems Great. and using those school teams to try to ramp up um, the excitement. We did, though, I can say, we were thinking about, you know, everybody loves a pizza party for coming to school, I'll, 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 chat about this and we were thinking about you know if you have great attendance and your class can earn a pizza party and I I said you know I, I would like us to look at some data I'm a data person I'd like us to look at some data before we do that because I want to make sure we're targeting the right thing right and if we can just think historically you know or if we can think about who loves a pizza party it's your fourth fifth sixth graders they want to get some time out of class they want to earn some pizza they have the best attendance in the district. <laughs> so we really don't need to target them, <laughs> right? They're doing great. They're seeing the importance of coming to school and they're here, right? Um, but yes, I love all of the ideas and please keep them coming. If you have more, more heads are better than one. So we're also gonna try a few things on a small scale so that we don't just roll everything out district wide and then you know, unsure of what's making the greatest impact. So we're going to ask a few schools that have had the more significant chronic absenteeism um, try a tier two intervention for students that are at risk of that chronic absenteeism. We're also going to increase sanitization and hygiene in five TKK classrooms. When we were doing this deep dive, we asked TKK1 families who have students who are chronically absent, and we asked them in a very empathetic way, understanding, you know, this is hard. 
right? As a parent of one of two of them, I understand. But it's we ask them how you know what are some of the reasons you're keeping them home? What are some of the barriers? What are some things we could do to help? And some of the things they talked about are one that because kindergarten isn't compulsory, I don't need to send my child, which is one of those you know we go back to. Academic achievement shows that if we send our children young, they learn early, which is great. And they build strong social foundations in our schools, so important. But the other thing they said was, when one child gets sick, they all get sick. And that, you know, again, we, we know hygiene's important. So we thought this could be some area, the improvement team that worked together thought this could be an area um, where we could try um, to make improvement. We also recognize that our students with disabilities in our most restrictive settings have some of our lowest attendance rates in the district. And some of that is because um, of hard transitional starts or because of some sleeping pattern challenges at home. And so some of the trials that we're going to be starting with these groups is the importance of coming to school regardless of the time. So that there might be second and third starts when you can get your child to school, it's okay. It doesn't have to be right by that first bell. If they can get here at all, we are ready to educate them when they come and welcome them into the learning environment when they come. So just changing, not a policy change, but a practice change of really helping our educators understand that it's okay. You know, we want them here for the whole day, but we'll take them here whenever they can get here. But then also supporting our teachers in that shift because it's hard to have a whole bunch of students walk in tardy, right? And so we want to make sure that we help them with that and we do this in a way that makes sense. So we're trying that in a few classrooms to, to test the impact. And then the very last one is um, looking at our tardy um, processes at secondary um, at schools. And so we also surveyed our seventh through 12th graders to get their, um, to, to hear from them about you know, why they're not coming. And some of them said, it's easier to be absent than it is to be tardy. And so um, we thought that's worth exploring, right? What is that and how can we help overcome that? Um, and we also know that because of our amazing online um, technological resources, they can also stay caught up on their work, even if they're not at school. And so we want to explore that further. So that improvement trial has not started yet, but it's one that's in the works. Um, so next steps, we're going to continue implementation of current actions, begin um, our improvement trials um, in TKK in early November, ready to hit that flu season, um, reconvene our attendance work group in December, uh, progress monitor using our data tool EduClimber and regularly share progress with schools. We will be modifying, ending, or adding improvement strategies based on our progress towards our metrics and reporting back to the board and educational partners along the way. And with that, do you have any more questions? Excellent. Are there any board comments or questions? Thank you. Yeah, that was very informative. It gets to a lot of my behavior analytic kind of thoughts where I just, I think there's been so much thought put into this and really, you know, meaningful strategies that you're attempting to get to, you know, the root of why attendance is where it is right now. So I'm really excited to see the outcome of all of this. Thank you. So again, thank you very much. Love, love the data, love the stuff. I, I have a handful of questions, but just real quick. The, let's see, the chronic absenteeism, and it's, I guess, went from 7.3 to 13.6. What percent of our kids are, like that 13.6% is not all students, right? It's 13.6% it's, it's of our enrolled students last year. Are chronically absent. Are chronically absent. So okay. So, uh, like, but, so again, then so fourteen hundred ish. Okay. So then. Okay. So overall attendance only like we used to be ninety six ninety seven and now we're ninety three ninety four. That doesn't come up to thirteen percent. Oh, okay. Good qu clarification. Mm -hmm. Two completely <laughs> separate metrics. So one is on the individual student level saying how many students, what percent of students missed over 18 days or 10% of the year. Right? The other is a separate having to do with all of the students that are enrolled in Rockland Unified. We count every single absence, right. divide it by 180, right? And that, 
sort of, and then you get to your, you know, your percentage. So it's basically saying how many days of attendance didn't happen, how many ADA of attendance didn't happen, Barbara can step in any time, but how many ADA of attendance did not happen because, um, because students didn't attend school, which is how you get the blue but line separate from that's the red the, line. So, so that 1%, that 1.3 million, that's, that's, that's that number, but the 13, you can't take the 13.6% multiply by 1.3, yeah, yeah, except no, that yes. number doesn't work out. Okay. Fair, fair, fair. Okay, um, and, and I think you addressed a few of them, so you talked TK, K, um, one, illness hygiene, start time, and tardy policy. Just overall looking at kind of recent metrics, we were 96, 97%, and more recently we're 93, 94. Any hypothesis as to why we went down so much? I have a lot of hypotheses. Um, so what we're seeing in Rockland is not dissimilar from what we're seeing across the state and across the nation. A lot of these illness are, I mean, a lot of these absences are pandemic related absences. We also are seeing um, residual effects of, of two changes that happened. One, um, mental health absences became excused absences during this time, and so families um, are able to excuse their students, understandably and justifiably so, for mental health absences. Um, so there's just been some changes to what's considered excused and unexcused. Um, we also have, um, we also were asking for, we changed our practice. So pre-pandemic, we would ask for students basic, or families to send their children to school and, unless they um, had a temperature, unless they were throwing up, right? When the pandemic hit and we opened our schools, we had to ask for symptomatic students to be kept home, justifiably so. They needed to not be in our schools. And so now it's help, we, we sent a different message for a long time, and now we need to revert to the other message, which is please come to school. If your child is significantly ill, please keep them home. I, I hope I am not um, saying that all children who are ill should come to school. I am not saying that at all. Um, but what we are saying is that um, students, um, we want our students in our schools when they are able to be there. And so it's changing that message back to a sniffle doesn't have to keep you home, a headache doesn't have to keep you home. Matter of fact, those shouldn't keep you home, come to school. Okay, so explain to me, just touch on that a little bit about mental health and these, you know, doctor's appointments. They're, even though they're excused, we, we do get funding. We, we do don't not. get any funding even though they're excused. Correct. So in 1998, there was a law that said this. I know. I, it's, we were looking this up. It's like, wow, this has been since 1998, and people, yeah. this is still something we all don't know. Um, I've learned a lot through this process. So... We have um, any excused absence is an absence that does not generate revenue for the school district in a public school, except for an independent study absence where students do the work, complete it, and turn it in on time. Right, and it's three consecutive days as right. well. Okay. Yes, and, and if a student is on home in hospital, so they are out for four weeks under a doctor's order um, and receiving home and hospital instruction, they would also generate ADA. And trustees, I'd share that one of the biggest interests that we have, California School Boards Association, acts a lot of groups that care about education, is to re request the state of California to change the model of how public education is funded. We need to be funded on enrollment, not on attendance. And the reason being is we fully staff our schools, expecting every child to come. We provide bus transportation for every school to get there. We have the books as you certified. So we fully have to staff and take the expense of every child coming up front and then not be funded for that is, is very problematic and, and, and really uh, is, we're one of the, a couple states in the nation that funds this way. So we uh, encourage any of your advocacy efforts to, to assist us in reversing uh, a law that doesn't meet the realities of what it takes to fund public education. 
Before I finish here, I would just like to um, appreciate Sarah Soris, our coordinator of ELD Gate and Special Programs publicly. She, one of the many hats she wears is our district supervisor of attendance. I can stand up here and present on this, but she does much of the legwork behind this and our attendance clerks work tirelessly, tirelessly to process all of this attendance every day. So um, I'm very grateful to them for the work they do on behalf of our students um, and our families. Just one more, and I, I don't, I'll assume you don't have the data, but just curious. Um, I know we said we're, call it 9394 currently, used to be whatever. We have, uh, we always do in most of our metrics outperform the state of California. Just curious, in comparison to Placer County, other local school districts, are they in that same range as us? Are they 96, 97, 98 like we were? Are they in the lower 90s, or is everyone in our area in the same? ballpark I currently am only able to get our districts data because these are from um, CalPEDS data that was certified this um, summer this past summer for last year's attendance but soon this fall we'll start opening up all of the different um, reporting metrics where we can see Placer County data statewide data national data so just know that uh, what I'm hearing what I can share is what I am hearing from my colleagues is we're all trending up a little bit Right? But what I, what I can assume is we're still going to be in the top, um, even in attendance, but we want to continue. Our local achievement data shows us that when students are here, they are learning and they are achieving. So that's our hope to, to keep A thousand percent coming. agree. I yeah. just, again, it's, we tend to always compare ourselves to California, and we yes. always do very well against the state of California. So just want to, don't want to always compare yourself to something that's an easy metric to beat. I agree. Tracy, I know I've spoken a lot, but I just want to really reinforce that um, based on, on the board's leadership of really wanting to ensure that we actively work as a continuous improvement district that you see in this presentation, you've seen in math, you've seen in other areas, that we really have consistently applied improvement science to how we attack issues. And a lot of that is first understanding the issues you heard. We surveyed students, talked with parents. We at a round table of a collaborative process to really understand and then to not just hope things get better or throw a pizza party, but to really look into, oh, it's TK parent concerns, or these are the months to target messaging, and, and to really have a deliberate scientific approach to this. And the fact that our system um, was able to realize this last spring, do the work of the planning so that we hit the ground running first week of school implementing versus spending a month or two to plan to hope to make a difference. So really just want to uh, thank the board for the leadership and support of a continuous improvement culture in our district, and but the staff you can see did phenomenal work to put, to put this to reality. Completely agree, Roger, completely agree. I, I love the PDCA, I love the continuous improvement, I love the metrics. I, yeah, I just, if there's, if there's anything that we, in, in recent years, Here's what we have, here's where we want to be, setting a goal, and then working with plans to achieve it. Just, I love seeing that stuff. Just, I was just curious on, are we way out of whack, or are we in line in a comparison? So, thank you, thank you, thank as you. As soon as we know, you'll know. <laughs> All right, thank you very much, Hannah. Thank you. And up next is item 10.3, Craig Rouse, Senior Director, Facilities, Maintenance, and Operations, presenting the 2023 Summer Facilities, Maintenance, and Operations Project Update. Good evening, Board President Hupp, Board of Trustees, Superintendent Stock. Got my technology going. Let me get that going. Uh, I'm pleased tonight to, to bring an update of our uh, summer 2023 facilities maintenance projects. Tonight we'll be talking about our maintenance projects, facility capital improvement projects, our summer 2023 routine restricted maintenance projects, and then what we're proposing to do next year for our routine restricted maintenance projects. 
But we'll start off with maintenance projects and, and just kind of a summary of what these projects contain. Uh, maintenance projects involves functional checks, servicing, repairing, or replacement of necessary equipment, machinery, building infrastructure, and supporting utilities. So for the district, um, our maintenance staff goes out, we get a work order that comes in from a, a school site, and we have a leaky toilet. We'll go out and fix a leaky toilet, or we have a flush valve that's broken, or light bulb that's out. Those are the type of maintenance projects that we take care of um, throughout the district. And, and Last fiscal year, um, we completed over 4,680 work orders. So that's continually going up as the district continues to age. And then since July 1st, we've kind of been tracking this over the last few years, we've had well over 90 HVAC work orders. Now we weren't as hot as we were last summer, but it's still, we still had some hot days and um, quite a few units went down. And really want to thank the staff, um, being flexible with our staff as we had to move classrooms around so we got the air blowing. and keep the kids in an air-conditioned space. And something I want to kind of touch on, and we've seen this since uh, COVID, we're still seeing unreliable manufacturing and delivery timelines for not only HVAC units, but it's really everything that has to do with construction. Um, you, they'll, they'll give you the latest lie that they tell you, and you wait for something to come, and it's delayed. So we're still trying to schedule and, and make things work uh, for our timelines for projects. So some of the facility Okay, we'll go jump into facility capital improvement projects. And just a quick update on that. It's any addition or alteration to real property that adds to the value of the property and then prolongs the useful life of the property. So uh, this first slide here, we're looking at uh, a portable building that we put over at Cory Trail Elementary. This is the before and after school program. And so by adding this building to the project, we've added value to the campus. So that project is uh, substantially complete. We're still waiting on rod iron fencing and chain link fencing that's been on back order for about two and a half months. Um, but they're, they're able to now use the building. The next project I wanna talk about is over at Parker Whitney Elementary School, the admin building. We took some significant water damage last Christmas. Um, and then uh, working through the insurance and, and gutting the, the place out, we are able to put some uh, new cabinets back in there, new flooring. Uh, I want to give a shout out to uh, Terry Alway, the principal over there and her staff. Very helpful as we went through this process and, and being flexible because we had to move them in the middle of the school year to a, another location. And, um, and then they were very much involved in putting the, the, the admin building back in place. And you know, their vision was, was spot on. And if you get a chance, go over there and check out if you can recall what Parker Whitney used to look like, the admin building, and what we have now, it really flows a lot better and it's much more usable space. Another project that we're working on, and uh, you heard uh, Director Matt uh, Hebb talk about that earlier when he came up and introduced himself, is the electric bus infrastructure project over at Transportation. Um, we have the pads are down, um, uh, which is great news, and Unfortunately, this, the switch gear that you know, powers these things up is, was a year out. Um, so the switch gear is supposed to be here in May, but we were able to uh, work with our electrician on site and get three temporary uh, charging stations up and running. They'll be operational um, in the next couple of weeks. So when the first round of buses come in October, we'll be able to charge them. And then Matt's got a plan where he's going to rotate the buses so we'll get them in use. So. Um, it was a great team effort to collaborate to, to make that happen. And then some other 2024 future projects that we're looking at, capital improvement projects, is Cory Trail Elementary School. Uh, we're seeing some uh, continual growth out there. Uh, that's really the last area in the district that's growing. And um, we're looking at dropping five portable classrooms out there this summer to handle the pr projected growth. Um, the contract was approved for the architect. The project is in the design phase. Um, we also approved the uh, portable building contract last board meeting, and um, we're looking to start that project in spring. So I've been working with uh, Melanie Patterson, Principal Patterson out at Cory Trail, to see how if we can get on campus to try and start this project prior to summer. Because th typically, we, we start when school's out, and then we complete in August. But with the delay in equipment, and the portable buildings and all the, the, the materials that go with this, 
Um, I really feel the need that we need to start this project a little bit earlier, and she's going to work with us, and um, we'll, we'll section off that back area by the fire lane and start hopefully in April when the project comes out of DSA. We'll bid the site work and start moving dirt uh, prior to summer starting, and that'll give us an opportunity to be done before school starts. So collaboration projects. So this, these, these are the types of projects that we do where we get um, volunteers that want to come in and, and facilities or maintenance is able to help them out um, throughout the year. And th this was a, a special project over at Springview. Um, end of the year, um, kind of a stress release. Uh, they, wanted to open, they wanted to open up an area in their, their break room. And so we assisted them and we brought the sledgehammers in and the mask and the eye protection and we took down one of the walls and opened up an area so that they could have a, a larger staff room area to, uh, for their breaks and lunchtime. That was a lot of fun, by the way. So routine restricted maintenance projects, just to touch on this real quick, this is a, includes the work required to preserve the buildings and equipment in such a manner that they can effectively be used for their intended purpose throughout their estimated useful lifespan. So this would include regular schedule, reg, regularly scheduled maintenance as well as periodic repair of plumbing, heating, air conditioning, electrical, roofing, and, roof, and floor systems. So in this case, we, uh, this project here, the Whitney High School pool decking resurfing project, um, over time, all that action right there, they come out of the pool, they come off the, the blocks, and they go down to the locker rooms and the bathroom, that surface had become very slick. So we went on ahead and we resurfaced that area, coming off the diving blocks down into the locker room. And that took place at the beginning of summer. And then we resurfaced the Rockland High School tennis court. There were some large cracks and a lot of movement out there and we included pickleball. Um, and a lot, of, a lot of folks are using it. It's great to see it in use and that project came out very well. And I'll talk about this a little bit uh, in my in future slides, but we're gonna work on Whitney High School next year. We decided based on the budget that we had for this summer, Rockland High School was in worse shape, so we took care of Rockland High School this year. Plan is to do Whitney next year. Are you gonna Another, use burgundy paint on those? What's that? Are you gonna use burgundy paint on this? For Whitney? Like maroon paint for Whitney's quartz, or are you gonna use blue? <laughs> well, <laughs> it's gonna have to be burgundy. Yeah. In kind. We'll in see, kind. huh? Uh -huh. Paint, paint in kind. I don't think 30% does. But um, another project that we wrapped up, we had some water intrusion over at the Whitney High School Theater. Um, if you recall, we, we you know, fixed the roof last year. Now we're coming in doing the exterior, and we were able to paint that building right at the end of summer, right, and actually kind of as school started, so the campus was very helpful in working with us to wrap that project up. And then other projects that we completed throughout the summer, we did asphalt repairs, um, slurry seal and striping at Rockland Elementary, Whitney High School, and the district office. Um, we did asphalt blacktop uh, crack filling at all the elementary school sites. And we're going to do that every year as the, these blacktops are continuing to move. So we're, basically, we're building up a base, and that's, that's going to be a priority to continue to do that. Uh, sewer line replacement at maintenance and operations. Um, the, uh, when when the, that, that building was built, we had to push the sewer line and, and up 160 feet to the, to the road. Um, so. When JMC, John Moyer Homes, they, they built the development right next to maintenance and operations, we're, the master plan for um, the city and the district was to have that building connect to the, their, their sewer line. So it was only 30 feet away across the wall. Instead of pushing it all the way up the hill, we were able to tie in right there and we wouldn't have to repair the pump station every couple of years like we had been doing. Um, let's see, did I move it? Concrete replacement, this is ongoing. We did Cobblestone, Breen, Rucola, and, and um, other elementary schools. And you know, it seems like we're seeing more and more concrete lifting than we have in the past. So we have one of our maintenance staff uh, going out and grinding concrete throughout the year. We purchased uh, our own grinder a couple years ago. Um, much, much cheaper to do that in-house now that we have that set up than continually hire someone to do that. So that's ongoing. We had some water damage. Uh, wall repair at Breen and Antelope Creek. That was from all the rains that we had last year. We were able to do that during the summer. And then we're replacing uh, portable siding at multiple schools. That's going to be going on this summer also. And then fire alarm replacement at Parker, Whitney, and Rock Creek. 
We did some main gym, main gym bleacher repairs at Rockland High School, along with converting room B51, one of the portables in the annex, into the 18 to 22 transition program. That program was growing, so we converted that back into their room. And then we replaced the door locks at Rucola. Um, as you recall, we've talked, coming out of the safety committee, we're, we're changing the way that we're locking our doors um, throughout the year. So we're able to take the electronic door locks from Rufla Elementary, replace them with a key lock, and then now we have parts for Whitney High School because it's the same type of locking system. And so as we continue to get funding, we'll look at replacing in, you know, Whitney and other, the other couple schools with electronic lock with door locks, but in, with key locks. But in the meantime, we have replacements to um, keep Whitney High School going, and we had quite a few doors that were inoperable. Uh, Mark V. Sign at Rockland Elementary. We did a wrought iron fence installation at Sunset Ranch. Um, special ed program grew at Rockland or Sunset Ranch, and so we had to add um, some wrought, uh, wrought iron fence in the back of the school by the, the drop off there by the kinder. And then intrusion alarm upgrade panels at multiple sites, and that's still ongoing as we continue to troubleshoot the systems throughout the district. Floor replacement at Twin Oaks and Rockland High School. Water line repairs, and this is kind of an ongoing, we talk about this every year. Um, you know, you, you fix a, a main line break, and then it breaks 20 yards down, and it's just continually chasing that. So, and we're, we're able to do that in-house and save the district a lot of money. And then we did some HVAC, HVAC control upgrades at Rockland Elementary. And then our total routine restricted maintenance expenditure for last fiscal year was about 1.7 million. So anticipated projects for next year, talked about this a little bit earlier, we're gonna do the asphalt repair, slurry seal and striping. I'm looking at doing Breen, Sierra, Sunset Ranch, and Whitney High School. Those schools are up about a three to five year rotation. Try to stay with that schedule. Do some interior and exterior lighting replacement at Granite Oaks and Springview, some roof repair at Whitney High School J Building. We also just discovered that Breen needs some roof repair. So, I mean, as we go through the year and we discover more and more that this will change. And then HVAC repair at multiple sites and then concrete replacement and grinding at multiple sites. Irrigation water line repairs, flooring replacement, and then continue, continually look at our energy management systems. And those are the controls that control the airflow for HVAC units and, and you know, hot and cold. Um, we have a, uh, a NOVAR system on eight of our sites and it's like 25 years old. So it's way past its life cycle and it's starting to fail. So we're trying to get out in front of it and replace these systems as we go through the year. Um, water intrusion painting at Whitney High School and Springview Middle School. We'll look at how the budget's looking as we head into the new year. If we have money to do that, that's, that's kind of the last things that we do. We take care of the other uh, projects first. Um, audio-visual replacement, and then communication upgrade at Breen and Antelope Creek, and then we talked about this a little bit earlier, Whitney High School tennis court resurfacing. And then uh, you, you guys touched on this on your updates, and I appreciate that, and I appreciate your time. We did the workshop on September 13th. Great questions. Um, we're going to plan on bringing the FMP forward uh, as an information item at a future board meeting, so we're still working through that. And then our next steps, we're going to continue to complete our summer 2023 projects. They're in the, the punch list mode, we're trying to get those completed. Supply chain delays are still having an impact on us. And then as we go through the year, based on the need, if we get multiple storms again, um, that list changes. You know, it goes to roof repair and room repair, carpet repair. Um, unforeseen maintenance and repair projects will impact. And then we'll bring an update on future projects out to the board as we head into springtime. That concludes my report. If you have any questions. Awesome. Happy to Thank ask you them. so much, Craig. Are there questions or comments from the board? Yeah. Again, just so thank you very much. I, I think um, people don't see the detail, the list, all the work done. You, 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 know, you only see the major projects, right? And I think there's a lot of little things that are done by, by you and your staff and, and to keep it all moving. So thank you. And I, I think traditionally in government institutions, et cetera, you, you get a lot of wait and see. We don't know. So I just want to say thank you to, for creatively reusing door locks, for adapting, adjusting, working around schedules with, with different supplies and that kind of stuff. So just thank you for that because it keeps 
as opposed to, hey, it's not my, you know, my fault, I'm trying to do everything, you're, you're, that creativity keeps this district and keeps the schools and keeps everything running and efficient. So thank you very much to you and your staff for, for always doing that. Thank you. We know we have excellent maintenance staff and crew. Yeah, we really do. Shout out to them. They, they yeah. really work hard. Big time. Thank you very well, much. I Greg. really appreciate the increased communication the last couple of years. Um, you know, I know a few years ago there's a lot of talk about, um, you know, what maintenance is happening. Um, is maintenance just being deferred, right? We had we had serious issues and things we had to fund, but the reality is we also have aging campuses, right? And there's a responsibility on the board to make sure that those remain safe for our students. And so, um, you know, I know when I was looking at line items a few years ago, right? It's okay, where's that? Back then it was, I think, 1.4 million. Where is that going? And is it is it needing to be used for other things that, that really were emergencies at the time? And so I really appreciate you being able to say, hey, look, here's how 1.7 million was spent this last year just from our routine restricted maintenance for the sole purpose of making sure that we're maintaining our facilities. And so I thank you for doing that because it can get very easy to push that aside and um, I'm sure very tempting for school boards throughout the state. Um, but I know that's been a priority of mine from the beginning uh, that that really, that really remains untouchable because it's, it's, we will always find other needs, um, but making sure our facilities are safe is, is critical. So thank you for the work that you're doing. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Craig. Thank you. Okay. We will now open agenda item 11.1, .1, public comment on non-agenda items. We want to remind everyone that this agenda item is to give anyone in attendance an opportunity to ask questions or discuss non-agenda items with the board. The board is not permitted to deliberate or take action on non-agenda items, but may refer the matter to a staff member for follow-up. A complaint about a specific employee of the district shall be made to that employee's immediate supervisor or the principal as required by Administrative Regulation 1312.1. The board will not permit any disturbance or willful interruption of board meetings, persistent or excessive disruption by any individual or group shall be grounds for the board president to terminate the privilege of addressing the board. Under recently adopted law, disruptive individuals may be removed and excluded from the board meeting. We appreciate the public's participation and your assistance in helping the board keep its meetings efficient, effective, and respectful. For verbal comments, please fill out a green public comment card, complete with all information, and turn it in prior to the agenda item being closed. I'll call your name to step up to the podium and let you know who's on deck. When you approach the podium, restate your name, the city you live in, and the school your children attend. You will have two minutes to address the board. All com comments must be respectful, no profanity. Okay, up first, Mark Bayer, and on deck, Amy Wenzel. Hello, my name is Mark Bear. Uh, first off, I just want to clear something up. Parents, teachers, and faculty that are against the outing policy are not against parental rights. So for anyone that thinks that and spread lies, get that out of your head. It cannot be further from the truth. What we want as parents is for these kids to stop having everything taken away from them. For instance, a highly edited video surfaced and defamed the leader of a very good church and the landing spot. Without so much as taking a moment to let the dust settle, you take the landing spot out of schools. Countless teachers and students came to the landing spot's defense and, uh, and sorry, I lost my place. Um, sorry. And instead of listening to the students and teachers, you listen to the parents. Then, after an investigation proved there was no wrongdoings, we still have not yet heard an apology. Then, we have the issue with the outing policy. You suddenly create this discriminatory harassment policy, which is US Constitution and California Constitution has the right to protect a sexual orientation and gender identity private. So that's 
answers your question, Tiffany. Um, then you have the audacity to go on about how you have consulted with legal counsel, which, as far as I know, uh, there are not students here at the school. And Now the student and teacher showed up to speak against this policy and let the re record reflect as was earlier stated that we were not bused in. We are concerning parents. And this, again, instead of listening to the teacher. Mark, thank you. That's time. Appreciate it. <laughs> now, sorry, now we have Amy and up next is Price Johnson this together I'll just continue on where Mark left off um, I think that it is very upsetting that before public comment even started at the last board meeting four of you told us how you were going to vote and that the public comments were irrelevant there was no dialogue countless students parents teachers uh, are against this you ignored all of us you talked to us very condescendingly, saying, I don't think you even read the, the policy. Um, earlier, you talked all, for a long time about let's increase attendance. Well, while you were talking about that, I just pulled up the CDC website that among um, students, 15.5% have missed one or more days of school because of bullying and safety concerns during the past 30 days. Well, your policy guaranteed kids are gonna feel less safe and they're gonna miss school. The calling it parents' rights, we all know it's not about parents' rights, it's about being against gay kids. We know it, you know it. You're not you know, fooling anyone into thinking that those of us advocating for the students want teachers to um, Let's, let's trick parents, let's keep secrets from parents. I would hope you don't think your teachers are a bunch of weirdos and perverts that are trying to do weird things to kids. If they're not telling the parents something, there's a reason. It's because they think that kid isn't safe. I've raised two children, my children are adults. I've also been a foster parent to children whose parents have done horrible things to them. Not all children are safe. Most parents are great. We are against this. Thank you, Amy. <laughs> Up next is Price Johnson, and on deck is Bruce Yandel. Hi, uh, Price Johnson, father of two at Rockland Elementary, daily classroom dad volunteer, as well as weekly club sponsor. Uh, I just wanted to talk about the audio recordings that surfaced this last week. Um, from President Julie Hupp, where she, to a group of religious leaders, um, boasted about her open uh, uh, obstruction of district work, district policies, curriculum, uh, as well as characterizing the California Teachers Association as a force of evil, as opposed to a force of good. Um, I think that's telling. I think that that tracks. I think that that tracks with a board that is willing to pass LGBTQ plus policies without consulting with LGBTQ plus families or professionals. I think it's telling of a board that ignores the mental health expertise of, of mental health professionals as well as social workers that appeared this last week. I think it tracks with a board that would come in here today and attempt to blame the inability to discuss this policy in a public forum on the LGBT community that showed up in response to the policy that you stepped in here telling us you would be passing ahead of public comment. You said it multiple times, Tiffany and Julie and Derek. You made it clear that you had come to this flirting with the Brown Act, coordinated and ready to vote yes. So in my opinion, this tracks with this board and it tracks with a president whose husband would show up to the last board meeting, cut 75% of the line off, take up a seat, a non-comment seat that could have otherwise belonged to a student or a parent affected by this policy, and whose husband would continue to boo the teachers' associations that made comments that night. I think that tracks with the leadership we're seeing from this board, at least from four members of this board, Counter, Seifoff, Hupp, and Price. 
And again, I'm gonna ask this community and the, the Rockland public to really take deep consideration to the actions and words from this last year as we head into 2024 election. Thank you, Price. Up next is Bruce, and on deck is Shannon Cantonella. Good evening. I'm Bruce Yandel, and I'm a Quarry Trail parent. Last spring, the school board voted to not approve a unanimously recommended science program. To justify your vote, the board falsely claimed that the committee didn't follow education code procedures, which it did. At the meeting, the teachers union talked about broken trust with the board. As a result of your tactics, we have over 2,700 students using outdated or inadequate school materials this year. At last meeting, the school board approved a controversial policy, a policy that the board warned was warned in advance about the vote to approve, a policy that places our school district's finances at great risk, and a policy that was objected to by elected representatives of the students and the teachers. To date, we don't know the board's planning for this financial risk. Either you have a plan and you're not sharing it, or you don't have a plan for the impact of your policies. All I'm asking for is the board to support our schools, teachers, and students. Please stop selecting words out of codes and phrases to way to deceive our community to justify your actions. That's not how policies are written, nor are they legally interpreted. Please stop using the school board for your political purposes. Take your agenda elsewhere. Your actions are impactful, more impactful than your placating words. School ratings are down lower than 2021. Our kids are using substandard, substandard materials unnecessarily. And teachers are asking for trust. And they're asking not to be put in school. Bruce, thank you. That's time. So now we have Shannon, and on deck is Marcy Johnson. Get started. You said that questions are allowed. When you gave, you like, can ask them, but we can't answer them. Okay. Okay. So um, I had a, a intro made, but I'm I'm just going to change it up. I um. I'm kind of churning inside tonight, and I think it's, I'm just exhausted, I'm tired. I'm sure you guys are all tired, but um, I'm tired of fighting, and I would rather we um, follow in the steps of a lot of the conversation I've heard tonight as far as commentary. I did really like the gentleman who just spoke. Um, I liked um, Mrs. Winter. I thought she did a good job following it finding a line where we can meet together and have conversation. Um, because I don't want to get lost in any more lawsuits, and I don't want to get lost in any more arguments about stuff. Um, and I know you have lawyers on staff to look into many of the things, particularly the things re regarding the um, September 6th decision. I'd like to ask tonight if the board would please supply the public with those documents, those briefs. It's my understanding that you hold the power to unseal those documents, and you can motion to do that. So I think there's going to be, I think there already is great interest to see the conversations regarding the laws that um, support the position that the board took and also support or explore the position that the community felt was also a law. And I think the community deserves the opportunity to see those cases and see the briefs so we can also understand what you were basing your judgment on. Um, I, don't, I don't really get a lot of responses back to my emails, though, so I'm not sure if I should put it in an email. Um, I will try to follow up. Thank you, Shannon. <laughs> Mark. 
Marcy Johnson. I'm actually a mom of two at Rockland Elementary School. Um, I'm actually going to cherry pick a bit off of what um, Tammy, right? What a, a Shannon. <laughs> um, the, I feel like the only grounds that have been brought up about this policy is this legal advice. I think it was brought up that it's a 16-page legal advice maybe during the last board meeting. I could be wrong there. However, as somebody who has worked with legal team around regulatory policies, I can tell you that you can get legal advice and you can choose not to go with that legal advice. You can make a decision to not go with that legal advice. So the fact that you guys keep saying that, hey, I've got legal advice, for me as a parent, that means absolutely nothing to me unless you tell me what that legal advice was. Because for all I know, your legal could have said, this is a horrible policy. This policy doesn't make any sense. Where is this? I get why you don't put it out there, because if that is really what this legal advice was, I wouldn't want to bring that to the public to open up the RUSD for, for lawsuits. I wouldn't want to do that. But I can tell you, as somebody who works with legal regularly, you can totally not go with what their advice is. So we need to stop saying that legal advice is what we're using for these policies unless you're willing to actually bring that legal advice to the table. So that's actually it that I want to say. I do want to use my last 20 seconds. I know a lot of district employees were here last week and this week, and I just want to thank you guys. I, I know it can't be easy, and last week was really difficult, but you guys did a wonderful job um, on making sure that everything was cordial. So thank you guys so much. Thank you. Thank you. So next we have item 12.1, pending agenda items. Trustees, do you have any items to be placed on the pending agenda? Okay, in that case, the meeting is now adjourned to closed session.